Welcome back to Theme Park Wizard on this matinee show. Saturday afternoon. What a rarity. And I'm here with the lovely Vash Guy from the OG55 crew to talk about a whole host of stuff. How are you today, Mr. Dr. Dre? I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. I'm uh, very excited to talk about some some of these topics uh, that that we've been hearing so much in the news about. I think it'll be pretty cool to to, to break some of this stuff down. So I really do appreciate you having me on. And if anybody else uh, out there wants to go ahead and uh, uh, follow me, you can go ahead and do so right down there at Vash Sky, just like it's uh, represented on the bottom of my uh, screen here. And if you want to see me, well, it's going to be on the. Uh, Orange Grove 55 channel at uh, Freshly Squeezed, your source for juice, news, and info. Squeezed fresh right from the Grove. And you, there you go. You better follow them because they have almost daily videos of him and Mr. OG himself with topics that I didn't think could be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so, including they just had one with all the Disney 100 announcements. So, check it out. Check it out. And speaking of Disney 100, but actually going to the holidays. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll mention 100 in a second, but I, I want to go ahead and uh, do the story first. I think this is fascinating. <laughs> Disney's holidays start November 11th, of course, um, through January, whatever. Universal Orlando's holidays start November 12th. Very exciting. Now, see, when I went to ho the team member preview night at... Halloween Horror Nights, you went on the lower lot, and my little eyes spotted Christmas lights up on the buildings. I'm like, wow, they're starting really early this year. It's going to be great. It's going to be bigger and better than ever. And then, you know, you, you go now, like, I just filmed the a Nintendo update last week. By the way, side note, thank you to everyone who's watching the Nintendo updates. The last one is one of the biggest ones ever at 5.5 thousand views. So thank Ooh, you so much. Nice. Wow, Peach's Castle, really got everyone excited. But, um, so, thank you. But when I was filming that one, the trees are all wrapped and all those Christmas lights are up. So I'm like, wow, they're going to start, like, right around the first week of November because why is it all up now, right? And then they announced here, uh, much to my disappointment, in this lovely press release. Oh, Sherry, how does this work? We want to share the Chrome tab. We want to share the... Oh, what happened? Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, sorry, guys. I temporarily woke up 20 minutes ago, and I am now dumb. But <laughs> we're going to try to share this one, but then go over? No. Okay, we're going to go... Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's a very inception. I... Now, now you see how the fudge is packed, you see. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, so we're going to stop sharing there. And we're going to get my non-dumb moment going. And we're going to go as if we've never... See, that's the trippy part because this is not what I... Okay, so I'm going to go back again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go and share the thing as if I haven't done this a million times before. <laughs> Here we go, guys. We're get Why is it not? Oh, that's the one. Okay, so we're here. <laughs> so the it's starting hall on November twenty fifth after Thanksgiving again, running daily through January first. Now, my I'm so curious why they're putting it all of up now when you know it's like another tease. When they're not going to start until after Thanksgiving again. See that number, Dre? You see that? November 25th. Yeah. Crazy. That's so long. And it looks very nice. I mean, I love Grinchmas. But then, you see, they're going to have... It's not going to be anything different than the other times. They just have the Harry Potter stuff and the stuff in the plaza. And that's pretty much it. So it's not going to be like bigger or better than ever like Horror Nights was. So I'm just, I feel like they're, I don't know, why is it starting so early? I mean, why are they putting it up so early? It's not going to start so early. Well, if I had to guess, and, and we noticed a little bit of, um, what is it, chicanery <laughs> at mm -hmm. uh, Disneyland as well. 
Um, if I had to guess, I think this has to do with some labor issues in the uh, Southern California market. Mm. Um, in order to get the same amount of work done, if you have less crew, I mean, the really the big factor there is time. So mm. I think they're starting maybe early in order to get kind of ahead of uh, of the whole holiday uh, um, festivities and make sure, just to ensure that they're ready to go, uh, even if they happen to have a smaller crew. And I think that's what's playing out here, if I had to speculate. You know, that makes sense, because that way that's already, by November 1st, that, you know, 90% done, and then they just need to mm. put the tree up, and then that's it. Oh, that's smart, but also, dang it, I really thought they were going to go bigger and better, because they started in, in September, September, September 6th with the first lights. That's months ago. Oh, it had me very excited, and then I was very disappointed. Well, there, I mean, there is a chance that they, you know, add on to this year's festivities, and 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 that's why maybe maybe another reason why they're starting so early. Uh, but uh, you know, the these entertainment departments, at least Disney does. Uh, I, I happen, I, I don't really, uh, un, you know, uh, it, know uh, Universal's uh, entertainment uh, department in quite the same way. But uh, if I had to guess and speculate, because <laughs> Comcast seems to be copying everything Disney does. Uh, you know, there's a there's a year round crew for these things, and so if that crew, you know, uh, that uh, actually maintains and adds on to and 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 actually uh, uh, it does these uh, um, uh, what is it the holiday festivities, um, you know, I mean, if they if they do add more on, then yeah, that might be another reason why they have to add on that why they have to uh, start earlier uh, in the year than the normal. But if I had to speculate. Sounds to me like it might be labor issues, and, I, and we're seeing that at Disney as well, uh, where you know holidays are colliding. Um, but, but not only that, but but uh, they're also starting earlier, and you know you're seeing some bunting down, some bunting up, that kind of thing. And, and mm -hmm. um, I, I I I wouldn't get my hopes up too high, and unfortunately, it looks like uh, <laughs> Universal is already getting ahead of the story. It seems like. Yeah, it looks like it's already the same thing, but it's okay because I'm still hoping in 2023 we're still bigger and better than at least the earlier start time. My goodness, the after Thanksgiving kills me because, you know, it's after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Orlando's the 12th. I get Orlando because they want to have more time because it's more time for the tourists to pop in. But we want more Christmas, God damn it. <laughs> well, I mean, now, do you think also, too, one of the reasons why they start so late um, when it comes to the Christmas season in regards to, you know, November 25th, as opposed to, uh, uh, um, you know, Disney starting, I believe they start November 11th, a three day weekend right there, November 11th. I'm right. So do you think it's because of Halloween Horror Nights and you know it's that it's that transition between teams? Yeah. yeah no. Let's see. Well, let's see. the only part of Horror Nights they really need is the plaza, and they just have to take down the bar, which takes a couple, just like a day or two, and then well, the rest, the whole thing probably takes a day or two. They have to build the tree. The whole thing could easily be done in a week, and I know it's okay. in a week. So I could still start November eleventh. And like I said, other stuff would be more, I guess, Halloween Horror Nights, you know, packed with the lights and stuff because, you know, there's scare zones, you have to navigate. But those are already all up. So the least impacted by Halloween Horror Nights, besides the actual, they just have to start it when it ends on November 1st, um, is the plaza because that's where the tree goes. But other than that, it's, um, and I've seen them put it up in a week. So, and unless there's, like you said, there's a, it's a labor shortage, so maybe it takes two weeks now because there's half the people. But that's really it. Um, and I know it's funny, last year and then this year, mm -hmm. they, so they used to extend Halloween Horror Nights into the first week of November. And like, ooh, added dates. Yes, but November, because it all sells out. And this year it's all selling out. So it's not like it's doing horribly. It's doing very well. But sticking to right after Halloween, so, I think that might be Christmas related, you know, because they realize they ought to get this tree up really fast. So they don't do the first week, you know, um, because they didn't have the there when they did that. They didn't have anything in the plaza for Halloween Horn. They didn't do anything extra 
special bars or anything in the plaza. But now that they do, they cut off that extra week. And I think it's, yeah, obviously, probably because of Grinchmas related, which is very interesting. Well, there you go. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, I, I think there are several dynamics, uh, uh, playing out here. And, um, you know, if, if you're working with a reduced team, gotta get ahead of it. I, I think that's what that, that's what that is. But I think that brings us to another thing that might be happening in the upper lot going to the lower lot, which wizard oh. to your credit. You were very, yeah. you were part of the very select few who actually had some advanced knowledge on this. And when you, when you uh, described it to me at first, uh, this was months ago, I was like, wow, this is stunning. This is amazing. And now it looks like those chickens might be coming home to roost in the form of permits and permit applications. Wizard, go ahead and take it away. Oh, yes. The permit has been filed and. It's crazy. Me being an urban planning major, I could not find LA County's three permit. No, LA has three permit sites, and it makes it very difficult. But that's the third one that I never checked. Is the one that has all the permits. Ah, crazy! And it's funny. It's actually the easiest to navigate. <laughs> you know what you're doing, and it's hilarious because what happened? Oh, here we go. No, so. Oh, this one's called Epic LA. So, of course, Universal covered everything. Mm-hmm. All the important information. But here's the face. <laughs> and look. Oh, what? Well, just kidding. This is actually from 2015. But um, <laughs> if, you put, if you put in... It's on Epic LA, right? You put mm-hmm. in 3900 Lancashire Boulevard. Is that... That's uh, the address of the Comcast office towers. So that's where they're filing all the permits from. And then, um, if you have to play it around a little bit, but then I think I, I bookmarked the actual. There you go. This guy. Hold on. I think you have to share that exact tab. Yeah. Hmm? Bob and sharing again. Permit. Where to go? Okay. It popped up twice. This one? No. Why do I keep doing that? Hold on, hold on. Uh, this is quite interesting, folks. The uh, this this coaster here. I mean, look, <laughs> my 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 feeling uh, uh, for University of Hollywood is that you know, and, and I think a lot of uh, you know other uh, guests in the Southern California market have this kind of same feeling when it comes to Universal Studios Hollywood is that there's not mm-hmm. enough attractions. There's not enough, mm-hmm. you know, and. It seems like uh, for uh, a major swath of the last two decades, Universal was just uh, uh, obsessed with the with the idea that they were going to go ahead and uh, replace attractions rather than add. And it was so frustrating because it's like, man, I, I you know, you really want to see this thing grow, and uh, they're just, uh, it's you know, it's. I know it's the land spatial issue and all that. I, I know their their opportunities are limited there without really uh, adjusting um uh the the what is it the juxtaposition between the 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 studio um and the theme park itself you know that that kind of combination and and moving some things around i know it takes a lot of work in order to add rides and not just replace unlike uh <laughs> disneyland seemingly and some of these other uh Ooh. theme parks around the world but to get a brand new coaster that is seemingly not replacing um, anything. M- yeah, Important. anything or, or much substantial. I, I think uh, the the, uh, the initial reports suggested that, or the initial rumors suggested that the animal uh, actor show was being replaced. Is that right? Yes, the animal actors in the special effects show. But now yep. it could just be the special effects show. Oh. That's kind of disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! It depends, I, 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 on, it depends on how big the uh, the station building is, and if they can work the track around animal actors. I guess. We'll yeah. Well, it's 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 it is kind of disappointing to lose the uh, the special effects show because it, it it is that that one last vestige i think outside of the actual studio tour itself that really maintains the kind of um 
studio production identity that Universal Studios really has. A lot of parks copied it um, uh, throughout Hollywood the 70s, studios. 80s. I mean, MGM Studio. MG, what was it called? MGM. Uh, Disney MGM Studios and then Disney's yeah. Hollywood Studios. Huh? Yeah. Uh, but, and it, I mean, that's the uh, example that comes to mind at first jump. But you know, many uh, different, uh, uh, whether they be uh, studios themselves, theme park companies, f- kind of followed that blueprint that uh, Universal Studios uh, Hollywood laid out um, so well uh, back in the, uh, <laughs> I guess, the, what is it, the, the, the 60s? Um, mm-hmm. And then, then on. You know, I, I, I like, I, I adore the idea of maintaining that for guests of the modern age, modern age. And, and I know with the with Blu-ray and DVD extras and stuff like that, people have a, a, a they understand how movies are made now uh, far more than they were in the middle of the 20th century. But I don't know, you know, when University is Hollywood, uh, it's the one park that can really maintain that. And I think authentically and genuinely. Uh, so to see that go, uh, not, not so great. But go ahead and talk to us about this project. Let's see. And also, they, they still have the tri- and the studio tour that's very historical. Of course, of course. Uh, let's see. Okay, so. Yes, as a Universal quickly hit all the information. <laughs> um, I went all the way back to the screenshot of the permit. Because guess what? You can't delete. Well, you can, but it's hard to get rid of a screenshot that keeps getting passed around the internet. Mm. <laughs> So here is the official screenshot on file on October 2nd, which is six days ago. Um, 3900 Language and Boulevard. So they are going to do, they are going to do a geotechnical investigation of P409. Keep track of that number, guys, because that's the project number. Mm-hmm. The project is the load, unload building, and an outdoor coaster starts from the upper lot and will descend towards the lower lot. Along the side of the hillside in front of Fire Station 51 and back up and loop around the Starway Escalator, spelled wrong, number one. (laughs) (laughs) Now, see, this is exactly what the rumors were saying. Yep. Get on, uh, they mentioned a C-shaped spike, but you go on the top, you launch up above the escalator, drop down. Turn around, descend towards, the, do some stuff by the fire station on the hillside, and then you get to go around and come right back up, uh, which is great because it sounds like that's a complete circuit. You know, I wasn't sure. I, I thought it was going to be a complete circuit coaster, but sometimes you never know. Things with spikes could be a shuttle coaster, which would kill the capacity. So I'm glad it's not. But um, now, but yeah, it sounds super cool. Because, oh, oh, and of course, it should be drifting because it's fast yes. and clear, So it'll be drifting with an Intamin Cosmic Rewind style coaster going through there. So it, it will have some kind of, uh, what is it, car swivel component? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Not too dissimilar from uh, Cosmic Rewind. That's an interesting thing. Now, I think we had heard. I, I, I might Man, be getting on. my facts wrong here, so please correct me, Wizard, if I'm if I'm mistaken. Mm-hmm. We heard that this might um, be most similar to Pantheon over there at uh, Bush Gardens Williamsburg, another Intamin uh, coaster. But that's, a, I believe, a, a Blitz coaster. If that's if, if I'm not mistaken, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, there's a lot of comparisons to. To Pantheon and a lot of hopes for the Intamin Blitz model, mm-hmm. and this, uh, yeah, it should be a, that. But then something that new, like something, I guess there's like a, I guess a prototype of this new sp- controlled spin Intamin coaster. Wow, with, and that that with, would be uh, that'd be a first for. Uh, absolutely the first in Southern California, but also the first for Intamin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, definitely the first. Yeah, because they don't have anything like that. So it'll be very interesting. Um, and here is what we're describing here. So yeah, see, there's the animal actors. There's the special effects. So, yeah. and then you can see in the in the in the very upper right corner of the screen that's yeah. also Simpsons, and and Simpsons. you had the escalators kind of going. Studio tour. 
the escalator with two A's instead of one. And <laughs> and then Harry Potter over here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Fire Station 51, see? So I see. Animal actors could be saved if they make the building kind of like there. Yeah. But you're going to assume it's going to go up here, spike up here, mm-hmm. go up there, turn, then go under there, mm-hmm. do some stuff over here, then pop back over here, and pop, go that way, or go this way. And boom, boom, you've used some space that no one would have thought was possible to use, but you used it because it's on a hillside and it's a coaster. You lost nothing besides maybe the special, uh, besides the special effects show. That means you add it to your attraction count, and then you didn't lose anything, just like Disneyland does, and somehow the Orlando parks don't seem to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you you are right about that for sure. And and honestly, Universal Studios Hollywood, it needs more attractions. It, it desperately mm-hmm. needs more attractions to really kind of uh, uh, bump it up in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the very distinct marketplace that is the Southern California uh, uh, theme park market. Now, because it interacts with that hill in that way, it kind of makes it a terrain coaster. Yes, it does, and which makes it even more exciting. I mean... All the trees won't be gone. There'll be some trees there. So imagine like some some moments where you're zipping through the trees, like whoo wow. whoo wee. Woo. Yeah. Now, that would that would be cool. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. Now, listen, uh, <laughs> a lot of people uh, uh, remember um, <laughs> what is it that the the Universal's first foray into the Fast and the Furious uh, IP uh-huh. and. Um, you know, it, it didn't quite. Uh, I, I mean, the studio tour version, I think, uh, did did pretty well. It was very, very popular. People came from all over the place just to see it. Um, and, and you know, I mean, some people have reservations about having to endure that, let's say, every single <laughs> time they actually go into the studio tour. My feeling is it's, it's not it's not absolutely horrible. It's not fantastic but whether it's the universal studios hollywood version or the universal studios orlando version i think everybody kind of wants a little bit more when it comes to the fast and furious franchise i mean this is uh you know uh the premier franchise for universal really outside of a few others jurassic uh jurassic world being one and and so forth uh, it's just it, people want the speed. They want the excitement. They want what they see in the films represented in real life. And I think this is a great way to go about it. Yeah. And, you know, this is, and you no, know, every coaster, even Disneyland has like a, a major coaster sort of source. Yeah. You have the Incredicoaster, coaster, right? Yep, yep. Magic Mountain has a whole bunch of major coasters. Nas does. You know, Universal doesn't, you know, Mummy's a fun one, but it's very short, you know, but this one, this would have, like, give Universal, like, a major, major coaster that people can see um, from the freeway, maybe, and, you know, I feel like every park needs at least that major coaster, again, the Incredicoaster coaster is popular, and Magic Mountain has their coaster, so... This would feel like fill a nice void in that and part of their attraction. I would fill up a nice void there. Yeah, I, um, you know, you, it's interesting you you say this because you think about like Knott's Berry Farm. They have Ghost Rider. That's the big coaster that you can see from the mm-hmm. from the streets and everything. Mm-hmm. Disneyland has had the Matterhorn for years, ever since 1959, mm-hmm. and I think uh, I think Space Mountain uh, mm-hmm. in 1977 has kind of uh, allowed for some of that. The big one I think was uh, 2001. Another Intamin coaster, California Screaming. I think that mm-hmm. was that for them. You know. Uh, Magic Mountain obviously has a bunch of coasters, but uh, Universal Studios Hollywood, you're right. It hasn't really had that kind of coaster that you can kind of see from the freeway that makes you excited, that wants, that makes you want to step into the park and actually ride some rides. Yeah, just to give everybody, uh, this is this exclusive for your show, Wizard, uh, <laughs> because I thought this was going to be uh, kind of funny to bring up uh, in the context of Fast and the Furious, just to give people an idea of how... <laughs> Uh, um, ill-received, let's say. Fast and Furious was out there, Universal Studios Orlando specifically. Uh, this comes from us, uh, this comes from uh, 
at theme park moment, uh, <laughs> crazy ass moments in theme park history, <laughs> writes this. Uh, when asked at the IAPA Expo what the biggest mistake of his career was, Theory Coop, VP and Chief Creative Officer at Universal Creative, says it was not stopping senior management from building Fast and the Furious Supercharged. <laughs> this comment is <laughs> met with thunderous applause 2021. Um, <laughs> It's funny, I actually read that in the quote, and I was like, that's so funny. <laughs> I, th- I, I thought that was hilarious. I was like, wow, really? That, that, woo, man. He, <laughs> very rarely do you uh, see these creative types uh, working really, in the theme park industry. So, speak so candidly. I thought that was very They funny. admitted their mistake. That's hilarious. I must say, even here in the Hollywood, the studio tour, you mm-hmm. know, you have, you know, two 3D seconds, you have King Kong and Fast and Furious, and right. every time, almost every, not just about every time, mm-hmm. next people, and so, and this could be a different, different discussion, where it's locals versus tourists, but you know, the locals, at least me, and I feel like a lot of other APs, they yep. look at the studio tour and they like it, but it's not like, eh, it's not like, oh, we can skip it because you're a local, you can go anytime, but, you know, seeing people like Sean and Jessica, Frankie the Mouse, go subscribe. And other people, tourists, you see more people never been on it before. Like, wow, wow, wow. It reinvigorates my excitement for the tour. So we go on. Mm-hmm. And King Kong, every time, every time it ends, I hear about maybe 90% of the tram clapping, like, wow, yeah, that's the coolest thing ever, right? Getting the fast and the furious, and then it ends, then no one says a word. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> the same people, even though I'm, t- I'm talking about. You know, people that certainly don't follow, you know, theme parks or anything are on Twitter. People mm-hmm. from Asia, different Australia, different parts of the world are just visiting. They'll clap and cheer for King Kong. And then I always look at those same people that were clapping in my car at the end of Fast and Furious. And they're just like, oh, cool, cool. And then they're like, and that's it. And then we left. And I'm like, wow, that's so funny. <laughs> And and it's it's kind of uh, sad because, I mean, this the, the technology featured in Fast and Furious Supercharged, this uh, mm-hmm. you know the, the the tram version at least. I mean, it, it features uh, some breathtaking technology. Actually, it's it's, mm-hmm. it's even more impressive than even uh, uh, King Kong uh, when you compare the various technologies. Um, you know, you have a kind of a, almost a 360 degree screen there. You have uh, audio that'll just <laughs> melt your face off. I mean, it's unbelievably loud. Great motion, yeah, wind effects, yeah, fog. My favorite part is at the end when you, when you jump on the bridge and the, 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 the tram was like, Zhoo! I'm like, whoa, that's kind of cool. And then uh, I like it. No, yeah, I mean, it's 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 it should be better than it is, yeah. but uh, you know it, it's it's not quite as good as the sum of its parts, and 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 that's kind of what the oh, what the disappointment is, you know, and and I think a lot of that, a lot of that's the story, the setup. You know, it's kind of drawn out. It's kind of extended a little yeah, bit longer than it maybe it should be. The CGI, as we know, <laughs> ain't the best. <laughs> Anybody, when you go on that thing, and when uh, Vin Diesel hangs onto that helicopter, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Look at that scale between those two things, and you tell me whether or not they got that just right. Uh, not uh, maybe the best showing <laughs> for uh, the Fast and Furious franchise, and. And it's 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 rather disappointing because you look at the technology that's that's featured in there. You look at the, um, um, you know, how much effort was applied by creatives and stuff like that. This really should be a lot better, and it just doesn't it doesn't quite meet that that level of expectation. And, and especially when comparing it directly to King Kong. Now, um, I you know, uh, Wizard, uh, I'm kind of biased towards the you know the <laughs> physical space and. Man, I really miss uh, the, the, the King Kong that was yeah, featured there. Electronic, yeah. <sighs> Designed by Bob Gurr. I mean, it was just a, a, a great technological showcase. Actually, very, very simple design, but one that worked effectively. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, yeah, I was saying, yeah, it was very impressive. That massive. And even in the one on Florida, the confrontation, the whole so the right yeah. smooth suspending from the thing. King, I was like, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I we we've seen some really good iterations of the of of Kong featured in these parks and 
I don't know, you know, the screens. I, I, it, like, the motion's pretty good, and, and it, it, there is a lot happening around you. Uh, but it's just, I don't know. I, I love that physicality. I love that going through that, that, uh, that, what is it? Uh, uh, U-shaped track there. And, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was, I thought that was phenomenal. But, um, you know, hopefully with this coaster, Fast and Furious will finally be represented in the way that guests <laughs> expect from this, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> guilty pleasure fl franchise, let's say, right? Uh, at least that's Ooh. how it is, how it is for me. Yeah. Um, and, and get some speed. The drifting sounds unbelievably cool. If they can get some swivel in there, that would be phenomenal. Uh, mm. Intamin has had a, a, a rather great showing, not maybe from an operation standpoint, but from my guest enjoyment standpoint, they have, a, mm. they have had a great showing at Universal Studios, uh, uh, Florida, specifically Islands of Adventure. We, I, I, honestly, I am, <laughs> I can't wait for this thing. Uh, now, the timeline for uh, Universal coasters, mm -hmm. they go with uh, some 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 pretty good theming and so forth. Do we know maybe how long this might take as soon as construction starts? You know, um, and first of all, I want to do your Fast and Furious finally comment. How long has it been like? Actually, how many decades has it been until we get a until we're finally getting a proper like ride? <laughs> Fast yeah. Furious, like twenty, like. I, I I think wasn't the uh, first film in the late nineties. Oh yeah, late nineties. Woo, almost thirty. Years. That's great. Let me, just, let me just make sure. Let me just check here. Do a little research here, because that is quite a while. <laughs> wow. But you know, at least they openly admitted that, <laughs> that yeah. they failed two times. <laughs> Sorry, filming late nineties, two thousand one. So yeah. over twenty years. To your point, wizard, right there, spot on. Wow. You know, oh hey, you know, props to that executive for admitting his mistake. At least they're correct. <laughs> there you go. Got a little bit of applause there. Got a little bit of applause. Because I, I think, look, I, I, no matter what you think about the Fast and Furious franchise, I think people, whether they like the franchise or not, they were at least, I, I think they are excited about the prospect of actually stepping into that world and, and experiencing something that's you know, uh, thrilling, exciting, fast, you know, and furious <laughs> um, and, and something that represents the franchise. I think people, even if you're a critic of the franchise, would be like, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Um, and, and we're know. getting it. And, and 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 like you said, Wizard, a new attraction that doesn't replace an old one. Uh, it, you cannot love this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, these movies, at least the last couple made up like a billion dollars. So oh, I yes. mean, a lot of people like them, even mm -hmm. if people say they don't at least they watch them because can't make a billion dollars if it doesn't like some but that's um, true that's true. part of this construction timeline so yeah it's the first permanent file now as you see which lines up with the rumors i've heard of it starting in uh, construction that january february timeline mm. from then it should uh only be open in a year so it should be open by 2024 where uh, i'm saying i'm thinking and some other posters were thinking as well because with, I mean, while I'm sure it'll be very highly themed in the queue in the building, you know, hard to theme the side of the mountain. So, and no, no one's really going to be looking there anyway. So I feel like most, I mean, I feel like it might be like a Velocicoaster type of thing where some mm. of it, the first half to be really themed, but in the second half, it's how it goes over the ocean, the lake is not too themed, but looks beautiful. You know, yeah. it's a theming in its own, right? You know, and that could be the, the mountain could be the theming because, you know, they do a lot of desert racing in uh, Fast and Furious. So it could be a, mountain and they race in the mountains too so that could be the theme the mountain will be the theme <laughs> and i can hear all the people saying no there's no theme da, 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 da. Well, it's, there is now buddy <laughs> yeah I, I think people will forgive theme if the actual experience itself is phenomenal mm. and intimate coasters let's be honest here <laughs> i will say not the most operationally consistent they're not your b&m types where they just run and run and run uh intimate coasters they have their operational foibles however if the experience is thrilling and and, and, and exciting enough which intimate coasters have historically been for the guest i think this should be a hit right out of the box no matter how much theming or uh, lack thereof is applied i, I think we're going to be in really uh really good shape i cannot wait for this to actually open i think it's phenomenal but that's not the only thing happening in Universal Studios Hollywood. Uh, we go from the upper lot to the lower lot. 
uh, to Super Nintendo and how that might oh, be affecting yeah. uh, Little Theme Park in Anaheim. Oh, yes. January, another reason why that rumor start uh, construction time in, is starting in January for Fast and Furious is because Nintendo should be somewhat of a soft open by his January, and it looks fantastic. Wow! Peach's Castle looks great, and you know what? I don't know if you mm-hmm. saw the Mario movie trailer, but even uh, Chris Pratt's voice aside, you know, mm-hmm. the world looks gorgeous. It made me want to jump into Super Nintendo World, which is really smart. Wow, they did it. They, the synergy of these people, the synergy of Disney and Universal with their movies and things. But I'd say, and it's coming out April 7th, right? So my guessing timeline is they open, they soft open in January, right? Mm-hmm. Have a grand opening because, no, just like uh, Tor- uh, not Toronto, Tokyo, they soft open for months. I feel like they soft open in January, have a grand opening around that April 7th time line to coincide with the movie. Also, because, wow, it looks just like the movie. I mean, which also looks just like the game. Uh, right. Oh, I can't wait to step into that world of illumination. You know what? Uh, I'm going to quote my friend, my good old insider, Grace Randolph, here when she said, you know, Disney's always has the headlines, but Universal's always, like, that number two that kind of sneaks in there, like, that, like, very quietly, that doesn't, like, say anything, do anything, but then they produce some quality stuff at times, and you're, like, they're just, Disney gets all the, everyone's out on Disney with the shows and TV headlines, and Universal comes in there with a couple billion dollar hits, you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? I didn't, I didn't even know like the movie's coming out. You know, Illumination does some great work as an animation studio. I feel like it's definitely at least second to like you know, Pixar or you know, the Disney ones because the, the movie looks gorgeous. Have you seen the trailer? I have, I have. Um, the movie looks gorgeous. It looks gorgeous. It, it looks gorgeous. It looks like the video game, you know, and, and what you would expect from it. This is not your, uh, uh, what is it, Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo uh, <laughs> version of the Super uh, Super Brother, uh, Super Mario Brothers or, or, you know, Nintendo World represented, right? The 1993 uh, mm-hmm. fantasy adventure film back then. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't like that, folks. This is uh, really for real here, and, and they're, 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 they're putting you in the game, and I like the jokes, like the humor. I think they 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 balance it out quite nicely. Um, but it just it looks amazing, and like you said, Wizard. It, I mean, when you look at the uh, uh, Super Nintendo World or uh, the the kind of Mario World that you'll be uh, walking into in the theme park setting, I mean, it looks like you're walking in there. It is fantastic. The consistency between these two things is just spot on. Yeah insane so i am super excited for that and i you know january also is when mickey and minis is gonna be opening up recently announced which is very interesting i wonder so you know the disney 100 Mm. celebration was always happening in january at least that's what they said on d23 um also separately we can talk about later Mm -hmm. i think they had the opening date like a couple weeks ago, D23. Why can't you just say it at D23? Or oh, whatever. You could have think they would, they, they, unless they just figured it out last week. Yeah. <laughs> but, because they announced the other stuff at D23. I don't know. But, um, they have the show. Wizard, you're, you're not alone in any of this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it seems like they're, uh, they're undermining their own expo. And it's very, very strange. And a lot of these things, you know, they, there are some contractual obligations between uh, partnerships with other, uh, with, with, with other creatives or with, with other, uh, um, let's say actors and so forth. Like some of those things get hung up. I, I, the biggest yeah, one probably I, I is. I understand the Deadpool thing is going to be a, maybe right. like who Jackson's paid or something. But I mean, yeah, you announced the shows that was coming for the Disney 100. Literally, you went a whole, you went back, they went back to Disneyland to say it. And like I said, Hey, guess what? And they ended with it. Guess what? Mickey Minis and all this starts on January 27th. Woo! Yay! But no, we'll say it later on in a random do, block. Do you think in the case of the 100th anniversary, um, 
what is it announcement right and we had the uh we got the you know uh new merchandise opportunities we saw mickey minnie's costumes what is it we we had the we had the bunting on the castle um the new nighttime shows and so forth and the announcement that uh, uh mickey minnie's running away railway will be opening on uh, january 27th along with the rest of the celebration not toontown which is interesting but we'll get into that <laughs> um do you think they separated that out because they they didn't want uh, what is it an overstuffed news cycle just contained within that weekend at D23. Do you think they wanted to separate it out to give it its own time so that you know the 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 normie tourists and guests who they they want to come in and, and 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 spend money that they actually get word of this? You know maybe, but goodness, I guess because we're theme park people, it didn't seem overstuffed to me. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. But, but, um, That's another story. <laughs> maybe because I mean, if you looked at the, the scroll, I get all my news. I follow all the news sites, but I, I kind of scroll through Facebook instead of actually going on like LA Times, or whatever. Um, because I just follow everyone and it's like all condensed. So sure. I, I saw a lot of stuff about the Avengers ride. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, maybe they're like, all right, that's good. Everyone's just reporting on the Avengers ride and Hulk coming. Mm -hmm. and if, the movie and TV stuff before that. So maybe they will. Maybe like, all right, we got enough news this weekend. So yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe, but also, hmm, unless they wanted to, because they're still going with the, maybe they wanted to wait till the January 8th. No, but that was already happening. So, you know, so they can pause the reservations because they snuck that in at the end. Right. Yeah. And, and to, uh, I don't know. Let's, let's hold, let's hold off on that discussion because yeah. that, that's definitely coming for sure. But, but yeah, yeah it's, it just seems logistically and operationally, the Disney well, management crews and how they interact with Burbank and so forth, it doesn't seem like they're really buttoned up in the way they were under Iger. It just seems a little <laughs> disjointed. It's a little left hand doesn't know what right hand's doing and so forth. <laughs> and it takes a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> more lubrication, let's say, to really get the machine rolling. And it's just, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's messy. Uh, Wizard, I do agree with you. It's, it's, it's just not it doesn't feel optimum. You had the the venues of all venues at the twenty three expo to really go into this and you didn't. Unless, you know, could have been all that and maybe, you know, because contrary to what many people may think, you know, you know, everyone knows, at least on the inside, what everyone else is doing. So the universal people know what Disney's doing. Disney right. people know what the universal doing, even though people may say they hate each other, right? But I mean Avengers Endgame is like filmed on the Universal backlot. Right. Portion. I mean, uh, if they hate each other, they wouldn't be filming on the and Universal film stuff over you know, they all interact whether you like it or not, things yes. so, so maybe maybe at that point they weren't sure when Nintendo World will be soft opening or something, right? Mm. And maybe they heard or talking to their friends and they said, you know, all right, all right, we're getting our shipment. It's going to be ready in January. So then mm -hmm. they said, okay, now they got that settled. Now let's move it up to the D23 week, or, I mean, the 100 weekend. But according to my chat, the, like a couple of weeks ago, they said Mickey Minis was 90% done. So I guess it'll be sitting there unless they don't. Well, you know, they could. They do want Tron sitting there until 2023. So I guess it could be possible. But you know, I feel like there could be a lot of factors. Maybe that's one of them. I, I, think, I think you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so yeah. Maybe that. Yeah. The intent. Maybe. And again, maybe the. When you get to the reservations, maybe they weren't sure what they were going to do with that. But now they're sure. So they wanted to. Or maybe they. I don't know. Maybe they want to get enough people enough time. Or maybe the calendar wasn't to January eight yet. I don't know. I feel like there's, I feel like there's a whole host of factors. And I think uh, it would be naive to discount mountains of factor. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it would be naive to discount any one of those. Um, I think they all kind of interplay between each other, uh, including, I would say, the opening date for uh, um, Super Nintendo World at, at uh, um, Universal Studios Hollywood. I. I Historically, they uh, Universal hasn't interacted with Universal in that way, they, or at least they haven't in quite some time. Michael Eisner used to <laughs> famously get ahead of everybody, but <laughs> but they haven't really done that in quite a while. Usually, it's you know everybody's marching to the Disney beat, not them marching mm -hmm. to somebody else's beat. So it's it's a little like mm, I'm not too sure about that. However, I 
I think it would be naive to dismiss it entirely. I think there is some interplay going on there. But the bigger stories I think are, that are playing out um, is uh, I think they really want to make the 100th a little bit special. I think they do want a big attraction tied mm-hmm. into that. So I think that also steps up the timeline. Also, too, like you said, Splash Mountain. That's the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. When Splash Mountain goes down, that's a huge people eater, right? Mm-hmm. Now, it usually does go down uh, in, in this window of time for its mm-hmm. normal maintenance routine. But uh, let's let's be honest. I mean, that's not going to be down for just six months. It's going to be down for like two years. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I think we're seeing like Indiana Jones Adventure, for example. It's got like a three-day refurb. But why are they doing it in November? Because they're trying to get ahead of Splash mm-hmm. Mountain closing. Once Splash Mountain closes, that's going to be a huge void uh, mm-hmm. for um, theme park operations in, at, at Disneyland Resort. So you know, how do you fill that gap? Well, Mickey Minnie's Runaway Railway is that attraction. And unlike uh, Splash Mountain, uh, which is very, very seasonal and very, very, uh, you know, weather dependent, right? Uh, I think Mickey Minnie's Runaway Railway, you can get, uh, you know, you can get guests in there, whether it be rain or shine, summer, winter, uh, day, night, doesn't matter. So, so it, I think it will be a huge boon. The, the very interesting, though, thing, however, is that they're opening this when Toontown. Uh, isn't opening. Now, you're right. We did hear from Mice Shed, I think Attractions Magazine, uh, they mm-hmm. were actually given a tour, a walking tour of yeah. the Runaway Railway, Railway and the Thank queue and everything with uh, uh, a uh, with Bob Chapek, actually, who they just had dinner with uh, at the Royal. With with the bit with the big cheese, right? And and I do give Bob Chapek credit for actually doing that, and actually, you know, uh, having the kind of uh, off the off the record interview with them and 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 joining them and stuff like that. I uh, OG and I made a video about this, and and I I do give him praise, and I still give him praise here. So this attraction is done. They had all those supplies come in early before supply chain issues were really disrupted. So that's ready to go. However. Supply chain issues may be not so fortunate for other aspects of Toontown that they might need supplies for. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Tron over there in Walt Disney World, apparently they just got their railing in, which was one of the things that was really holding them up. Because if you're building this stuff out in these uh, foreign countries who are going through their own, uh, let's say, COVID-related issues and so forth, mm-hmm. that's really screwing up the supply chain. It's really difficult right now to get to get supplies in there. I know that's one of the big things that's holding up Moana right now. Uh, they're mm. saying, uh, I think, um, the end of 2023, and they're not even sure that they can hold themselves to that date because mm. of the supply chain issues that they're having. And Unfortunately, Epcot's going to be a crater for longer than it should be because of it. But when it comes back to Disneyland, it's like, okay, <laughs> we can hold back the opening of this attraction, which we desperately need for operations and for capacity reasons as it relates to the reservation system and otherwise. We desperately need this attraction open. Do we just hold off on it uh, you know, until the land's open, or can we just open this thing now? And I think that's what they're going to do. If I had to speculate on what they're going to do, they're most likely going to op- going to be opening not just Mickey Mouse Runaway Railway, but also those adjacent... Um, uh, what is it? Um, quick shop. service windows that you mm-hmm. see there, right? Uh, maybe maybe the shop as well uh, that that's uh, might be in the area, all the way over to like the old gas station. Now it's going to be like Pluto's Mart or whatever. I could s- that provides you your restrooms, right? So your restrooms all the way over to Mickey Minnie's Runaway Railway, and if they wanted to, they could also add in Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin in there as well. So that gives you a nice. You know, a little fan of of different uh, amenities, attractions, and so forth that guests can uh, uh, make use of, and, and then that just leaves the residential area and maybe even the kind of uh, the the park that was adjacent to the downtown area as as closed off until they get those areas ready. I, I mean, and if they open that much area up, it's not the worst idea in the world, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And you know, January that time is usually the Slower season anyway, so right. I'll be closing the, you know, all people in right after the holidays, and also to celebrate the Disney 100th anniversary of uh, Disney 100, which would be mm-hmm. fantastic. I think it's a great idea. I've been very excited for this attraction. Super excited! For it. Like, wow, I can't wait. I hope Toontown they can find a way to make it safe until midnight now, please. Or even if they have to close during the fireworks, please open it back up because. uh 
because boy, you can't close at eight when you have Mickey and Minnie's right there. Well, so the uh, Disneyland guys, you know, we're we're insane. But um, uh, the the Disneyland guys have, you know, people that are kind of really going to know have been speculating this for a, quite a bit of time. How is the interplay between the fireworks and this new attraction going to work? Um, so now, some people have kind of said, well. You know, maybe it just becomes another Rise of Resistance kind of story where, you know, this ride closes early and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I don't quite think that's going to be the case, but it might be. We'll see. But the, the launch area for these fireworks was actually pushed back and mounted on top of the Mickey and Minnie's Runaway uh, show building at the, at the far edge uh, oh, of the property. Cool. And so... I believe it was uh, Alex the Historian and some others were actually going into there and saying, hey, look, listen, the the distance between this launch point and uh, Toontown proper is actually a pretty good distance, over 100 feet, which should be what they were suggesting, minimum code, in order to allow for uh, fireworks to actually, to actually still go off while guests are still in Toontown. Something that, that has never been uh, possible before be- because of where those backstage buildings were actually located behind there. Before, they actually used to use scissor lifts to get you up there with these fireworks and launch them off. It was a crazy operation. Now they actually have a, uh, a maintenance elevator or, or a, 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 what is a freight elevator that actually can take up these pyrotechnics and launch them on the various sites on top of the Mickey Minis runway of a building. Sounds, uh, this is a multi use kind of facility. Much oh, go ahead. Safer. Sounds much safer than the previous. Much, <laughs> much safer. And a good use of space. I mean, yeah. you know, you're kind of making use of this show building in multiple ways. And I think it's a great, mm-hmm. great way to go for the Zen Resort. Definitely should be thinking on that kind of uh, uh, wavelength going forward. But I know they've rearranged the, the uh, uh, um, what is it, the main launch site and so forth. So uh, theoretically, it should be able you should be able to have Toontown open in its entirety while fireworks are actually going on, which would be lovely. It would be right. And, and you could do projection mapping. OG has been a a very, very bullish on this. Um, You could do projection mapping on that huge flat surface that you'll gain with this show building. Mm -hmm. Now question, do the fantasy land rides right now still, does anything still close for the fireworks right now? Yes. Yes, it does. So, um, <clears throat> Mr. Toads, try to keep it opening. Are you gonna try to test it out? Or like, because if they still close this now, then mm. like I scared. What if they close Mickey's during the fireworks? If they don't have to. See, this is why Operations loves Mickey's Mix Magic because they don't necessarily have to close down, right? They don't have to close down Fantasyland and do that whole mm. uh, little thing that they do um <laughs> to in order to have a fireworks presentation every single night um because of its uh relatively low reliance on pyro in general they can keep a lot of those areas open and i think wondrous journeys will be will have uh will build this in uh, on jump right they you know uh, yeah it does seem that as, it seems like heavy projections with fireworks on the in the background as as a quote from Dave from Fresh Bake. Heavy projection right. fireworks on the secondary. And Dave is exactly right. There has been a trend by the company to, to um, uh, what is it, not have every single night time spectacular so pyrotechnics focused, mm-hmm. you know, uh, reducing the emphasis on pyrotechnics in general and mm-hmm. moving that emphasis towards uh, projections and some other effects that are one, safer, uh, but two, mm-hmm. operationally, uh, they're a lot more... Uh, what sounds noise to the neighbors? Yes, yes, that goes into the operational argument, right? Yeah. Uh, operationally, you don't have to deal with the neighbors in that way. Uh, mm-hmm. You don't have to close off whole areas. It's much safer, mm-hmm. obviously. Um, uh, there's no chance of fire and all these different things <laughs> when you do do power techniques every single night. It's very uh, the cost is also another uh, huge. Oh deal. yeah, another very uh, man to run those things at night. It's like they spend the whole summer spending millions and millions of dollars to do the fireworks every night insane it is it is and the uh i believe let's see here i thought the original okay maybe maybe it didn't uh disney has been quick to point out 
you're going to have pyrotechnics on select nights. And, and as yeah. Dave has pointed out, and that's a, a, a very astute observation on his part, um, that's them telling you this is going to be a more uh, uh, projection uh, mm. heavy show, which, and I told this to OJ and I'll tell this to you, Wizard, if they can go ahead and <laughs> um, replace Mickey's Mixed Magic once and for all as the kind of off-season show or the show that mm. premieres when there's weather or so forth, uh, I think that would be uh, <laughs> the, the the best for uh, guests at the uh, at the Disneyland Resort because mm-hmm. Mickey's Mixed Magic uh, you know, look, I might be an old timer here, but I prefer a traditional nighttime spectacular performance, at, at least at the Castle Park being Disneyland. And I just want to have those feels and so forth. So it'd be nice to finally uh, rid ourselves of Mickey's Big Magic once and for all. My, uh, just myself. You know, yeah. And we'll have to see how Wondrous Journeys is. Yeah, you know, I like, um, I, do, I do like how they, you know, they still play Disneyland forever when, like, it's too windy. Some of these are the projections. That's very nice. But, um, yeah, and you know, there's so much cool, it's 2022, well, 2023, when this premieres, there's so much cool technology, you know, uh, something that I know Paris uses in Universal Hollywood used for a little bit before the pandemic, whereas, you know, drones, and I thought those drones, seeing it in person, the Patrons was so cool, and the mm-hmm. Final Parks use this more often, you know, especially because here in Southern California, Every almost everything park surrounded by some sort of res- residential community, right? No, I think I know they wouldn't. And the, the fireworks, you know, props to them for living next to that. Well, although they choose to live next to that for mm-hmm. you know, however long, but I think it would be pretty cool. You can still have fireworks, but it, like maybe during the weekdays, have you know, put like a drone show, you know, to incorporate that way. You know, also that way the weekday visitors don't feel like they're getting shafted, you know, like what there's fireworks only on the weekends and where there's only projections. Right projections and drones on the weekend so it's quieter but still looks pretty and the residents yeah. wow that's gorgeous yeah and on the weekends you still have your fireworks because as much as i love anything fireworks are just like very special to me but i love drones so i think like a drone weekday firework weekend type of ordeal hybrid situation and even something for like world of color where you know it's kind of hard to have fireworks because just the setting you know right. drones right there like even if they're like kind of lower level drones on the sides like that'd be super cool i don't understand why more theme parks now disney springs use drones for a little bit and i think i guess the show didn't go well or maybe the drones weren't doing well it feels they took it away but that drones, was a uh oh, go ahead. oh yeah so yeah drones should just be more like prominent like especially because each year drone technology gets you know better and better i mean i still can't believe the way the, the patron is at the, at, the, at the dark art show, I know, it just moved its head. Even though it was just for like a like a few seconds, but I was like, wow! And everyone was like, wow! And I'm like, wow! Oh my goodness, this needs to be here more often. There's a video going around. Maybe I can find it. Um, for you, for for your uh, for your audience. Uh, the the thing about it is, if you remember, if you've seen the shows in Southern California when it comes to drones mm-hmm. in a theme park setting. I mean, the only example that we have really is Universal. But if you remember that show, it's it takes quite a bit to set that up. Uh, there's a bunch of oh, netting that goes along with that, and that right there provides you your reason as to why they wow. haven't really leaned into drone technology, at least with the domestic parks, because we're a much more, let's say, litigious society than uh, <laughs> some of the other countries around the world. And uh, some of these other distinct countries have a little bit more, uh, let's say, room to work with, and, and there are some operational things that you can do in order to minimize uh, uh, one of these drones going off course, which is, which is honestly the main reason why the lawyers here in the domestic parks uh giving feedback on this kind of stuff have really put the kibosh on on all drone usage uh, whether whether it be disneyland or walt's new world i mean it's it's and it's frustrating that that is that is the case because you can do some amazing stuff with drone technology in fact the uh uh you know i do have it here let me go ahead and share my screen right here. I just found it. The stuff you can do with drone-based technology is really, really stunning. I'll go ahead and show you this video here. Uh, this comes from us uh, by at Daily Loud. You can go ahead and see right here. Right there. Boop. And if you want to go ahead and share my screen, sir. Boop. 
Hold on. Woo! Oh, oh! That is a drone show in China. Um, Love you could see how impressive this stuff can actually get right here. It is fascinating, fascinating stuff. Uh, just the, the the potential for this is insane. And honestly, this is kind of interesting because originally uh, Epcot uh, w was going to go with a drone based show before they, you know, did those yeah, horrific right. barges that I'm mm -hmm. sure they are <laughs> regretting right now from actually doing. Um, originally, it was going to be uh, drone based, uh, and and that was uh, man, in the works for years. And it's just they couldn't. There were some technological issues, but they also couldn't get past, I think, the legal issues. It's been the hurdle ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. So you look at a park like Disneyland, how small it is. I can definitely see lawyers going, oh, I can't do I can't do drones here because I think they want some crazy, ridiculous figure. It's like they don't want any drones to become within like 100 or 150 feet of guests, you know? And it's just like, come on, guys. It, look. These Disney parks, every single night, mostly, um, launch <laughs> explosions in the air <laughs> every <laughs> single so night. How controlled is that? OK, I mean, yes, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the development of shells and so forth has gotten very, very complex. Right. It's gotten very precise but there's still a team out there who looks every single night at you know which shells aren't launching off correctly these things are unpredictable in a lot of cases and we've seen fires actually happen as a result from these every once in a while so it's like explosions in the air or a lightweight drone that you know could go off course i, I, I suppose it could hit somebody but i, I it's just it's not it's just not uh, it's it, it frustrates me, and that's why you have the net set up uh, on the uh, next yeah, to the studio tour so and so funny. forth yeah. for Universal Studios Hollywood when they do those drone shows. Uh, mm -hmm. like, right, and wow. I, I just don't think Disney wants to go ahead and set up nets every every single time they do this. There are a few places oh, where you could do oh, drones. Boy. Well, you could do look. You could do drones. I think. You know, uh, um, over the kind of backstage launch site, right? Mm -hmm. and if you are bright enough and illuminate them enough, I think you you'd be able to see those from various areas of the park. You could also, I think, do them over Rivers of America, over Tom Sawyer's Island at oh, night. I, I think you gorgeous. could do that. Is that yeah. place closed anyway? Oh my goodness. Exactly. And as long as you have your launch sites and everything set up uh, in, in key places that minimize uh, guest contact or, or guest proximity, I'll say, you can really do some some really effective stuff here. We've seen it done in Paris. I agree with you, Wizard. Come on, let's bring on the drones. They're they're fantastic. They're gorgeous. Yeah, exactly. No, there must be the drone technology gets better. There must be a way. To, if it goes, of course, to just you know, auto like I don't know, do something to make it come back. Like, come on now, that they're, they're, they're just smart people here. And if it goes off course, where's it gonna like? It's not like it's going to fall. I don't know. I just feel like there's a way. There's a way. It goes off course. And I feel like it's not that difficult. They have self-driving cars. They can have self-guiding drones to go back on course. And like you said, even if they're low-level drones, even if they move, like you can move them very, very uh, kind of slowly and into position mm -hmm. so that if something does go off course, it kind of... It, you know, it doesn't go at it with momentum, right? <laughs> it goes yeah. at a very low speed and it just kind of falls down. Uh, I know battery power is kind of a, a kind of a thing, but they're obviously getting more efficient on that as well. It's just like you can do this. This is possible and it is very, very well received. And it's I think it's the one effect that people will um, uh, that, that it's the one alt viable alternative to pyrotechnics that we've seen. I, look, I like the projection shows just like everybody else, but there's something special about seeing an explosion in the air, right? <laughs> it, it just it just hits us on a good or a level. But drones, I think, is the only viable technology that can I, that it could even come close to pyrotechnics. There's um there's definite uh, potential for this. Now look at this. Hold on. I, during the Super Bowl here in L.A. last year. Yes. Yep. I was, I, my friend lives here and I asked if she's working, but I want to go and see it. Mm -hmm. Multiple days of the weekend, they did a 
beautiful, the end put on a beautiful drone show right over, right over downtown. It was great. So let's, let's, let's take a peek at some of these cool. Look at this. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, it's there right is the convention center, and look, I mean. So people are becoming more familiar with this technology. Uh, I mean, look at the it. guests are anyway. I mean, look at that. That's that's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they're becoming more familiar with this, with the use of this technology, the implementation of this technology. Mm -hmm. It's becoming now where I think guests might expect something like this. Uh, not too far in the distant future. I mean, Disney's really uh, coming behind the eight ball on this, and and the look at that. I mean the. The potential oh, is the, extraordinary. The top is, I love how it's moving. And, oh, my goodness. They're both moving at the same time. Oh. That's, and then the fact they can just disappear and then make something else, like, really fast. Like, mm -hmm. I don't even know how they do that. That's crazy. I mean, it's pretty, like it's pretty simple to program. But, oh, my goodness. And I think even for Disney Plus Day, didn't they do some kind of a drone thing over the Santa Monica Pier? Um, yes. Part. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was for the bundle, actually. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, Disney Plus, uh, Hulu, and ESPN Plus bundle. I think that's what, 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 what's, what, what was going on there. Yeah, look at that. I mean, guys, come on. Let's bring this oh, out right. here. Now, you know, we've seen limited Good. drone usage uh, in Disney parks uh Domestically, uh, you bring up the Disney Springs example. Mm. Disney Springs, uh, that was a collaborative effort between them and I believe Intel. And, and you know, it was definitely a, a, a test. And uh, I think, oh, look at that. I mean, it's just like you could see the football player. Um, <laughs> that's, the ball. that's it, oh. man. It's, in, it's incredible. And uh, obviously they didn't, they didn't uh, do it again, but Santa Monica Pier, that is one of those instances where you can actually have it, you know, like these drones are over the ocean. So if anything goes off course, it's going to just hit the ocean and it's nighttime. So nobody's going to yeah. be out there relatively safe. And I feel um, like that could happen with the rivers of America. It just falls yeah. in the river. Or like you said, uh, uh, our own version of the Santa Monica Pier in the form of Pixar Pier, right? Yeah. Uh, do it. Do something there. Uh <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I, the world's oh, look, ready for these, drones. These are very slow. They're not going, f at least they don't look like they're going too fast. They're barely mm -hmm. moving, but it still looks amazing. And you've not really heard of an instance where a drone-based show uh, put on by these major corporations has had a, 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 an instance of, of them going off course and hitting a, hitting a guest or hitting a bystander. It doesn't really happen and now these drones are kind of so small that even if it did uh it's uh, i mean it's it's uh, it's not like a it's to put it in perspective on a theme park setting it's not like some you know cleat ripping off and it's not like some uh big uh, what is it what it was like some metal plate that sheared off or, or something on uh, Top Thrill Dragster over there at Cedar Point. It's not any of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Yeah, look, there it is. I mean, it's like, come on, guys. We're ready. We're ready for the drones. We're ready to actually bring this uh, to a theme park setting for real. Um, there's got to be ways to implement this, this stuff. It, look at it. it. Who wouldn't love to see... Come on, you have Darth Vader over Something like that. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Darth Vader, right there. The turning red, and look, the, the circle and stuff like that is phenomenal. Like Chippendale Rescue Rangers. I mean, you could do so much, and we've seen so much. We've actually seen it in really, really cool ways. Um, even mixed in with live actors, uh, Disneyland mm -hmm. Paris, for example, for the opening of Avengers Campus over there. Uh, they now had. Yeah, Doctor Strange doing it, and it was it was phenomenal. It was fantastic. Guys, and that's come a on! Cool Marvel show here, like then all of a sudden the drone pops up. Oh boy, so cool! And very look, very cool. Hopefully, look how beautiful. Oh, the, the best. I, 
I think the 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 most likely implementation of this is probably going to be in Epcot. The big rumor is is that the harmonious replacement will be drone based, which is like I said, what they wanted to do before. Yeah, I, did I think do that. Yeah, that makes sense. World Truck is looking it's huge. Um, yeah, okay. a large water body of water for it to fall and it mm-hmm. needs to Oh boy, that'd be nice because that'd be much better than I'm sure than Harmonies. I don't think I've ever has a show ever lasted so little. Didn't even make it to the fiftieth anniversary. Besides, maybe Kite Tales has a show, but like a large major yeah. show. Last I think so the little. the closest impl- the closest uh, um, example of this, I think, is uh, is Rivers of Light. Rivers of Light was oh, also yeah. very, very relatively short. In fact, when it was opening, Bob Iger famously said, oh, um, this is good enough and we can give this a second go around uh, uh, <laughs> later. You know, <laughs> even he wasn't quite um, enthusiastic about the show and, and, and recognized the potential, but also recognized that the first implementation, not the best. But Harmonious is a, is a, is a disaster. I'm hearing... I, I, look, I thought this show cost anywhere between $70 million and $150 million. That's where I was kind of uh, hearing those numbers. Apparently, it was over $200 million, which is just... What? That's an attraction for yeah. Disney. I mean, that's... <laughs> that, that, and that's something that you'll have for 50 years, at least. Uh, the fact that they undercut such an enormous budget for this... Uh, and apparently the maintenance budget for these things was far more uh, than anticipated. Obviously they wanted, originally they wanted these things to move. They had a dry dock out there, um, with, with the land ex- excavated with the intention to actually have these things go away every single night. And when that was cut and they made that monetary decision, and I understand they were going through a lot, you know, uh, 2020 and so forth. Right. I get it. But when you don't do that. Um, you now have these barges on the lagoon every single night. You have to have a show that really is unbelievably spectacular in order for the barges being visible throughout the day uh, to be justified, right? Mm-hmm. And, and Harmonious was not that show. So <laughs> you always had that working against it. Uh, the the limited i think visibility of this show from various parts of the lagoon was also a huge deal and for epcot i mean i i explained this to og and a couple of others but for epcot specifically the, uh, the, a nighttime show is critical to the operation of that park and the revenue generation of that park they fill out those restaurants along the that lagoon every single night <laughs> in order, it, because people want to you know, sit in and, and watch the show. And when you yeah. can only see these from various angles, and it's not such a great show to begin with, that really cuts into that food revenue. And also corporate events. It's just mm-hmm. all those things don't work. And that's why they were willing to uh, d- dunk on $200 million because it was like they're probably going to lose more money if they don't do it rather than investing in something new. Yeah, that's... Uh... And it's funny, all those shows are really recent. The Rivers of Light, the Harmonious, and the Kite Tail. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Maybe they should uh, spend more time drawing up shows. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, you say this, I think you're right. Um, I, I think they really have to hone in on what actually makes something out there in World Showcase Lagoon work. You know, what? go back to the basics. Look, Beacons of Light on Spaceship Earth was the thing universally seen uh, as the best part of the 50th anniversary celebration, honestly. Um, that's outside of the, sad. Yeah, and that's <laughs> it's horribly sad. I mean, this is, these are basically hue lights stuck onto a piece of architecture that was built in 1982. <laughs> and that's your best showing? I mean, come on. This is ridiculous <laughs> especially when you have drone technology out there and so forth go ahead it does look closely like to me like a drone show just without the drones without the drones right and <laughs> if now here's the interesting wizard you bring up a good point if you could have a drone show interact with beacons of light across the you know yeah. like it could be really cool you could do some stuff there um 
but but yeah, I mean, people view that as the best thing, and you <laughs> undercut huge costs for enchantment, <laughs> undercut huge costs for harmonious, and people are saying that beacons of light over there is the best thing. I mean, that is an, a spectacular failure. I just got to be honest. So, I, oh yeah, for, I forgot about enchantment. That's right. Not CD, huh? And that's kind of being semi replaced back with the pe- thing people want. Oh, come on, entertainment department, whoever writes these things. Right. Well, well, think about it. In, in the last few years, we have had Rivers of Light stupendous spectacular failure we've had enchantments stupendous spectacular failure harmonious unbelievable failure and it's just like they just keep Kite missing, tails. missing missing Kai tails and, uh, mickey and minnie's ma- mickey's ma- mickey mix mickey's big magic, I'm magic. <laughs> yeah mickey's mix magic I, honestly i think it's probably the best out of all those things so. Uh, <laughs> one can make the argument. I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know if I would go that far. I really oh, don't like well. Mickey's Mixed Magic, but, but no, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Mickey's Mixed Magic. At least people have fun with it, you know. And mm-hmm. Harmonious. I mean, it ends on such a dour note, you know. The uh, the the someday song, which uh, in the context of of uh, um, Hunchback of Notre Dame, it works, right? Because that is a very dark film and mm-hmm. at a time when it was, a, it was a dark time in history. So someday that makes sense in that context. But for Epcot, you know, people want that Illuminations type finale and when they didn't get that, it's, it's, it, it became not a... It wasn't as hopeful and as inspiring as I think they believed it to be. It became kind of a dour uh a sour note and, and that's unfortunate <laughs> yeah that's not fun i thought it was supposed to see the happy most magical place on earth not the most sour place <laughs> right right no I, I i i i do agree with you but um we've gotten a little bit like a drone um, we've gotten a little bit off course um, yeah i know we really have because it's pretty sour for people is you know the reservations are <laughs> A pause, as Mario would say. They're a pause! Right. So January 8th, right around the time where... I might have to see you soon, but right now, right after time, where, um... Let's see, in the holidays and rice, the busiest time of the period is over. That's when the rumored change-up to ticket password key holders um, is happening. Mm-hmm. That, um... Boy, I hope Splash Round doesn't close during then. Well, I hope if it does, I, I want I want to be able to ride the last log so that I better get a reservation. At Disney, open it up. <laughs> One hundred is happening then. A lot of stuff's happening in January, and then of course Lunar New Year kind of pops in somewhere out in there. Hopefully that right. pops. A nice festival. Hopefully they bring that back. But uh, yeah, a lot. Of, what should we call it? A lot of changes coming. What are some of those rumors that with OG fifty five group talk is talking about? Well, we you know you gotta uh, stick with the setup here. Uh, Disney Parks blog actually made note of this specifically. Uh, in the big announcement for the 100th, they say, as you begin to plan your trip to visit Disneyland Resort for the Disney 100 anniversary, please know that theme park reservation availability for Disneyland Park and Disney California Adventure Park is currently paused for dates beyond January 8th, 2023, and will resume for guests in the coming weeks. Now, I'm not so sure of that, because we had been hearing rumors, to your point, Wizard, you've been hearing rumors for quite a while, and um, I can't reveal all my sources on this, but we've been hearing rumors for quite a while that the reservation system might be altered in some way around January 2023. Mm-hmm. And rumor has it that uh, for annual pass holders, I, I don't think a lot will change because I do think the one context in which the reservation system makes the most sense is controlling annual pass holder population, specifically as it relates to, relates to the design resort. But it might change maybe dramatically for ticket holders. And the idea being, hey, do you necessarily have to have a reservation system in order to restrain ticket holders in the same way that you have to for annual pass holders? It doesn't quite make sense. Also, too, do we have to have it on every single day? What if we had a partial reservation system that only was activated for weekends or major events or major mm-hmm. openings or major ceremonies or uh, major holidays. You know, could we 
could we maybe navigate this in a way that allows for more unrestricted access for guests, uh, uh, but but still have it in a controlled fashion for APs? I think, honestly, with the rumors I'm hearing, that's what that's what this might be. And that's exactly what the Den- family from Denver wants. You know, <laughs> right? Exactly. That's exactly what they want. They they want unrestricted access. I mean, look, I'm telling you, I was I was in a hot tub <laughs> at a resort in Southern California with a family who had just come down from Canada, from Toronto, that was looking to actually step in to Disneyland. And I just had to tell them, look, if you haven't gotten, if you haven't made your reservation right now, you likely won't be able to step into the theme park at all um, during your entire vacation because of the reservation system. And that is crazy. You have an international guest who's looking to spend probably lots of money on their vacation for, uh, I think they had two daughters there, and you can't get in. It's Mm -hmm. it's madness. It's ridiculous. It's insane. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty crazy. You know, again, it makes sense. Uh, if you're going to have it, it makes sense for the annual pass holders because they're annual pass holders. They're right here. <laughs> no. But for the, yeah, the single day ticket holders, it's uh, even if the people who are non international, but like here, they live here, but like, you know, like once a year, once every couple of years, and like, all right, I'm going to go like, this year for my birthday because I can finally afford it. And oh, wait, I can't go because it's sold out. Well, that's a. Uh, Let's go to Universal instead, or I don't know. But it's like you know, there's I have friends like that. You know, they don't go too often, but they mm-hmm. they go like once a year. And you know, when I said when I, they went this year, I was like, all right, make sure to go get your reservation early. They're like, oh, what, reservation? I'm like, yeah, yeah, go get your reservation early because it could, could you know sell out. And then, yeah, and then but then they ask you know. You know, they have lives. They're not just sitting here and they're working, so they can't keep checking every day. Uh, you know. Because it's so annoying. They have to keep checking, and then if it's full, and they have to keep checking. Like I remember Fresh Bake had this cool guide on how to check for your reservation, and while it was very informative, informative, I'm I was reading. I'm like, man, imagine if you're just a regular person, you have to go through all these steps, check this day at this time, this time, because this time's open up. I'm like. They might just get turned away at that point. Like, yeah, let's just go to somewhere else. <laughs> like, <anywhere>. yeah, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, Wizard. You know, you you bring up a good point here. Um, Universal has been sending out surveys to this point, saying, "Hey, what made you go to Universal over Disney? Did you go to Universal over Disney? And if you did, was one of the reasons that you did because of the." simplicity of universal versus the complication over there at Walt Disney World. They're asking these questions. They know this is a reason, a big reason why some people uh, and not as not an insignificant amount go over from Walt Disney World or uh, Disney uh, Park Resort in general over to Universal because of the lack of complication, because of the ease of access, because it's like, hey, you know what? I buy my tickets, I get in. And and a lot of people uh, they 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 want that they value that, Ooh. and so I I mean I'll, I think Len Testa and Jim Hill were actually talking about on their podcast the Disney Dish podcast uh, were actually speculating when I, I mean Universal could actually make ads on that and what's the likelihood of them doing that and I think they both came to the term, determination that it, it's likely you know yeah. uh, and you can you can imagine how it is you can you can you can, you can see that ad in your mind. You you have a family going up there with their tickets, and they uh, they scan them and they get in, and it's like simplicity. Visit <laughs> Universal Studios. You know, it's like you right. You know, you can see it. So, in my mind, it's like, guys, this is. I understand. There's yield management strategies. There's there's stuff that, from a business standpoint, is advantageous for them. No question. And I think they will keep some of those aspects at least for, like I said, the major uh, holidays, weekends, and events, so forth. But do you need something like this on a random Tuesday? I don't think you do. I think your tiered mm-hmm. pricing structure was working, I, I, you know, in, in terms of controlling crowds and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the annual pass holders, it's a whole different story, especially as it relates to Disneyland because, you know, <laughs> the, the annual pass holder population is so large. But but I, the, the ticket holders, man, I mean, and the TOS for these new Magic Keys actually mm-hmm. outline that they could do this, that there are other ticket types that mm-hmm. where they might have more access 
than your magic key that you're buying into, or they might have unrestricted access uh, versus what uh, the magic key uh, system might provide for you. They were very clear in that TOS what they were going to do and what they could do. And that was around the time, uh, actually a few months after, I had heard that they were going to rethink the reservation system as it relates to both these uh, parks, both in Walt Disney World and in Disneyland, uh, Disneyland Resort, in January. I mean, that, that's that's what I was hearing. And, and what do you know? They have paused it. And yes, they say they will resume for guests in the coming weeks. They don't tell you in what form. Maybe uh, it is just for weekends. Maybe it is just for these events like that we have been uh, speculating that they might go into. Yeah, that's very interesting also because did they also, like Disney World's calendar, do they also pause? Did they also stop in January? Is it so far just Disneyland? I think it's just Disneyland, if I'm not mistaken, because... The reservation system, I think, um, as it relates to ticket holders in Walt Disney World, I think it's that's a different that's a different mix. It's a different balance, you know. Um, it's very, very uh, international and uh, domestic theme, domestic guest uh, dominant versus annual pass holders. But but even out there, I mean, I know the Epcot managers are, are just like we're getting killed. We're getting killed by the crater <laughs> in the uh, forecourt of their park. But but. Moreover, um, they have these festivals, as we all know, and they it's basically a year-round festival, and just the, the theme changes. <laughs> but, but those festivals really make their money, a, a lot of, a bulk of it, on annual pass holders. And when annual pass holders can't get in to visit your park or are restricted because of this, uh, you know, um, <laughs> what is it, uh, uh what is the word I'm looking for? This seemingly nonsensical uh, or arbitrary, I should say, uh, mm -hmm. restriction that we're setting on ourselves doesn't make sense. <laughs> now, Disney's Hollywood Studios, for example, I know those managers and operators are like, oh, we need the reservation system or else people yeah, would just like plummet our park. Smaller. You know, much smaller. And they have some of the newest attractions on property. Exactly. So it's like, oh, that doesn't quite make, work for us. So I think out there it might be far park more by park. park by park, much more nuanced, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, um, but but here's the other thing about this, and I think this is this might this might be what gives Disney pause on all this stuff. They're still having problems getting the public attuned to even having a reservation system in the first place. This is why there are big signs right before you step in, you need a theme park reservation to step in, right? Mm -hmm. It's very, it's, it's still a difficult concept for people to grasp that even if you buy a ticket, you can't necessarily step in. The only thing that might give them pause regarding all of this is do you add in a layer of additional complication and having a partial system and having a, uh, either all in or all off system, right? Uh, the partiality, uh, you know, it might, might, might give people a, a little, uh, um, a, more headaches than, than maybe it's worth. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But see, I feel like even with that, if you just did for annual pass holders only, then, you know, that takes away that problem because their annual pass, they know what to expect as they go all the time. If you just had nothing for single day ticket holders, then they just buy it, you know? Right. Like no one has, there's no add a layer of anything because annual passwords, they already know what to expect because they, they, they annual password. Yeah. I, ideally, that's what, ideally, that's what you want, especially at Disney Resort, right? Mm -hmm. And you can limit it, like, if you have an attraction opening, for example, right? Maybe then, okay, let's implement a reservation system for both, right? But I agree with you. The more open day tickets are, I think it's better for everybody. Yeah, you know, and if anything, right? Let's say because they tune up the reservation system now, uh, they make changes here and there, right? So let's say they're it's open to all the day guests, and they let's say January twenty seventh, everyone wants to go on Mickey and Minnie, so they just uh, they just go, they just maybe quickly make that a, a new block out date for all the passes, and then. Or if there are any days that they're experiencing like 
high t pre sales and online ticket sales, regular day tickets for the annual pass holders, they just make it a block as it, or they just shrink the amount of annual pass holder reservations for internally that day and make it sold out fast. You know, mm -hmm. then you can still keep that open and you just make the pass holders a little mad, but they'll still keep renewing so it's okay <laughs> and <laughs> and then that way the single day ticket holders will be happy or yeah. maybe i would convince some key holders to not renew but instead get do multi-day tickets instead which i know disney will be pretty happy about because it's like a pass but mm -hmm. you know they still have the same amount of money a lot of money still and then even if the, as long as the multi-day tickets and are with the single day tickets and they're just no reservations then Maybe we'll get some people to convert and they'll balance out the population a bit. Yeah. I mean, well, no, yeah. I, I, that's that's kind of the interplay there. And, and I think, you know, I think there are teams of people attempting to, uh, uh, what is it, to come up with an algorithm and actually, uh, you know, forecast this, right? Model this out, right? Mm -hmm. As these analytic types are like, are, are, apt to do and especially the bob chapek led regime here <laughs> i think they're looking at all of this and this january 8th kind of cutoff year is it's paused for a reason folks i think they are you know uh kind of attempting to figure out can we can we somehow make it a little bit simpler for guests that we most desperately want i mean that unfavorable mix right <laughs> we <laughs> definitely want more <laughs> tourists uh coming from out of state out of the country can we make it a little bit uh more accessible to them specifically uh while limiting in your basilers i think that they're, they're looking at that in every single way possible now with that let's say they do open it up Mm -hmm. With the new attendance policy, and uh, do they have any staffing issues there? I know that, and the taking away of the registers to encourage mobile checkout and mobile order, right. and all that, would all of that, if they made it a free for all, would, mm -hmm. would that, and that should, then this they just all of a sudden reached capacity faster, but then that's like a reservation. How would that, would that like make a, like a roadblock to opening it up for the single day ticket holders, maybe? Well, I mean, yes, and I think that's why they have been holding on to the reservation as tightly as they have, because they haven't overcome those labor issues that allow them to really open the gates up. They're not at full capacity yet. I know there are some reports out there saying that they are. No, they're, <laughs> they're simply not. I mean, look, the Hyperion, for example, that is still closed, okay? That, I mean... What is that? Uh, that does 1,984 guests, I believe that, mm -hmm. that that does. So we're talking three shows, we're talking 6,000 people. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily allow you to open up that much, but but you do gain uh, a few thousand there and a few thousand over here. And, you know, they still are having problems with servers at restaurants. I was just there recently, you know, I, <laughs> I had, the, had, had the big trip with... Uh, uh, I saw OG and, and, and George there, Wizard. Uh, definitely uh, come up to Hollywood and, and, and see you because I think that'll be really, yes. really fun. But just said recently, and got a table at Blue by You. Or no, no, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Cafe Orleans. <laughs> got a mm -hmm. table at Cafe Orleans. Um, I'm looking around, and it's like empty table, empty table, empty table, empty table. And I'm like, what is going Ooh. on here? I mean, it was just and, probably like a lot of people, like a line. Was there a line? Well, yeah, there there was a, there was there was a line out out there. Reservations obviously were booked out, you know, all the way in advance. But there were just a, a sea of empty tables, and I'm just like, what is going on here? People work them, huh? Exactly. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, there is some kind of disconnect between uh, operations and and the you know, people on staff, and because it, I think that goes into what is it the october 1st or october 8th policy with these cast members here where yeah. they're going to be changing up the point basis that they had before and and they're going to go with the strikes so. policy with that do you think they will lose more people or do you think it'll stay the same or do you think they that? will definitely lose people in the short term um and we're already like we we had already seen where some whole um uh, uh, 
amenities were just offline <laughs> because uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> because they didn't have the ga- the cast to, to fill those roles. Um, in the short term, they're definitely going to have some attrition. That is for sure, without question. But I think they really do expect that they will be able to staff positions consistently enough that will allow them to open up a little bit more unrestricted than they have been before. Um, but, but, but like you said, like you astutely point out, wizard, this, one of the things keeping them back from doing that is the consistent availability of cast members. It's just, there still are labor problems going on. Um, and, do you, do you, why do you think that is? Now uh, they've never been able to. So, um, back from the, do you think it's because they want like Cast members want a higher wage. Do you think they're finding better opportunities elsewhere that maybe pay more, uh, like surrounding hotels or surrounding types of different jobs? Do you think the work environment? Because I know separately that last time we went through the phone call, we were talking about you know mm-hmm. work environments. How how I was telling you I worked at Six Flags, Universal, and Disney. Now I prefer to work at Universal because of the yes. perks they gave you. Do you think mm-hmm. stuff like that, a combo of all of it, or is the magic of working there? disappeared or it's it's the the allure i know uh abigail disney put out her uh new documentary uh that that went into this a little bit but it's i i don't know again she has a little bit of more of an activist bent on the whole thing but apparently she follows some cast members who've been working there for various amounts of years and they were suggesting well it was fun to work at the park now it's not and i think the 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 shimmer that existed working at Disney pre twenty twenty mm-hmm. has definitely been altered post twenty twenty right I, I think there's something mm-hmm. there's an interplay going on there um, Universal I've heard is the preferred place to work and again if you're going to be getting minimum wage anyway do you necessarily want to do that in a theme park environment or hey I can work at some Apple store and get paid basically the same. And I'm inside a uh, cushy mall and you know, all that kind of stuff. uh, Not my local mall, Panda express. They see a big Mm -hmm. sign that starts at $17 an hour. Right. (laughs) Exactly. And so I was looking into this issue specifically because I thought this was a very interesting thing. And it was something I was trying to really find find myself. And there's a uh, YouTube channel out there called I am for fun. Uh, uh, pretty pretty amazing guy. Uh, the guy who uh, hosts it um, has worked in the theme park industry for a long, long time as kind of a major executive and, and owner operator of a theme park of his own, interestingly enough. So he is very versed in this space. And what he was suggesting was um, these labor issues have been going on for a long time um, for for decades. And uh Part of the reasons why they have become they, they they really came up during the uh, the events of 2020 is they were <laughs> they were getting to that point anyway, and as the oh. events of 2020 did for a lot of things, they kind of moved up the yes, timeline yes, there. Yes, speed it up. Yeah. So one of the things really is uh, you know entry level positions like like are, that are featured at Disneyland Resort and other places. Um, the school schedule is definitely affecting this. Uh, the, the, oh, yeah. the school yeah. schedule has been eating into the summer months, right? So that creates its own problems. But the big one is uh, Uber Eats, Uber, Lyft, all these kind of uh, uh, what is it? They they have a term for it. It's um, the, the, the gig, gig economy, economy, right? The gig economy. Thank you uh, for 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 coming that because that that's what it is. The gig economy has really changed the game, and when Things Hold were closed on. during 2020. Charge it really quick. Before oh, go ahead. We... Hold on. Don't worry. I got this. I got the show, Wizard. Don't even worry about it. You do what you do. But when the the events of 2020 really kicked off, um, that really, you know, when when a lot of these places that would usually have these jobs available weren't available anymore. Oh, people still got to eat, right? And those uh, stimulus checks only went so far. So uh-huh. where'd they go? They went, an enhanced emphasis was placed on some of these gig economy jobs that really provided a, a sense of autonomy 
for large swath of the labor market where they can take control of over the hours that they worked. They can take control over what they earned and how they did it and stuff like that. And that kind of uh, uh, what is it? That kind of uh, take control atmosphere. Empowerment. Really kind of yeah, that empowerment, right? That in, that in, really enraptured the entire labor market. And so that that's where they went is taking control over their own labor uh, essentially and so i think for these theme park companies and so forth that are looking for labor they got to get much more competitive um mm-hmm. and that's why it's like ooh, look at w- the direction that disney's going in <laughs> they're not you know adding more flexibility and more empowerment to workers working uh within design resort they're actually going the opposite direction and taking away some of that flexibility now i understand why they're doing that okay i i i get it you can't have somebody that this is the example they use somebody working i think at design resort called out like 60 or 100 times uh, it, literally, in a year <laughs> and couldn't be fired under the old system that's yeah, it allowed for rampant abuse. And when that happens, that cast member who has to make up for that role or fill in for that role, so they're taking on additional hours and they're being called into whatever, or they have to essentially make do without them, well, now you've just added 20, 30, 40%, 50% more workload to them. That's unfair to the cast member who chooses to come in. And so you can see, well, if they're going to call out, I'm going to call out, and it's just spirals, right? You can't have that. I get what Disney Resort is thinking, but you really have to be, you got to be tuned in here. You know, this is a new generation here, and, and, and we've not seen this level of empowerment in the workplace that we have before. I think these theme park companies have to get much more competitive when it comes to not just pay, but benefits as well. Uh, mm. That is really going to be the, the the kind of the next sticking point here, and I know Disney is against you know wasting those rages, uh, but but with the economy the way it is, with inflationary factors being what they are, I mean I just read a report uh, saying that uh, the the labor force is experiencing its biggest pay cut not seen in decades, um, uh, due to the inflation uh, problem. And there are going to be more economic issues at play here. I think Disney should get much more competitive when it comes to this. But I think Disney themselves are banking on uh, 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 the uh, an economic, you know, recession or uh, economic uh, downturn, so that that fifteen dollars an hour or sixteen or whatever that they pay that starts to look more attractive. And I think that's that's a risky, risky play. Yeah, oh man, yeah, that is, that's like a, that's a big gamble there. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, and yeah. you know, it's, you know, especially if the parks still seem pretty busy. So, you know, if we don't have enough people to work them, then uh, that would be a uh, pretty devastating. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. if you don't have people to, you know, build things, then that means the treehouse will mean will be under construction forever. Yeah, I mean, construction jobs, it's tough right now. Like I said, the materials are very, they're much harder to get. That is likely one of the big things that has stymied the uh, downtown Disney construction is just getting construction materials. Concrete, from what I understand, is, uh, I mean, it's just to get concrete in the bulk quantities that you require for a project like that. I mean, it could be uh, months, uh, uh, could uh, raw materials that you require, steel and so forth, even fabricated materials, all that stuff is really, really hard to come by. And that's why we've seen these projects. The the Tarzan Treehouse project and the, um, uh, what is it, the Downtown Disney project and so forth, that's why yeah. they have really been accepting that the way they have been. We're seeing that a lot in Walt Disney World with Tron and Moana and so forth, Epcot, right? I mean, it's... It, it's it's tough going right now, and there's a lot to contend with uh, on on the uh, on the um, theme park side of things. Yeah, because you know, even at uh, Nintendo and went on Bowser's head for quite a while over there. But uh, woo wee, get there. When do you think these supply chain issues will resolve themselves? Well, 
this is a very interesting thing. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a uh, there's a big country out there in the east uh, uh, in the continent of Asia. That <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Uh, I, I I I don't want to have any undue attention drawn to your channel. So I'm trying to be, I'm trying to word this <laughs> weird, right? Okay. There's a big country uh, in Asia uh, that uh, provides for much of the supply and raw materials and resources that uh, the Western countries uh, uh, get their materials and goods from, right? Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> right now, they have the uh, the the what is it the the zero COVID policy right and that oh, has yeah. really interrupted supply chain issues, um and has and has kept interrupting supply chain issues <laughs> ever since 2020 and they haven't really recovered, um honestly, for these to abate, be me okay, two years, uh, honestly. Uh, that's that's what we're kind of looking at right now, um, and that's really if that country that I speak of, <laughs> you know, let's go on 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 that uh, uh, zero COVID policy. Um, when you know as uh, you know as these kind of fiscal quarters move on, and and that's not that problem isn't alleviated. That's a big portion of the supply chain that that is just that is just time. And look here, here's the thing. You might have factories in the United States, in Australia, in Germany, and all these different places, right? That create uh, goods and and um, are are uh, that, that that have uh, factories in the industry that produce these things that we, you know we use every single day in our lives that we rely on and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay. There's probably going to be though a part in an appliance that you need, an electronic device that you need, right? That comes from that country that I speak of. Mm. Think about it. You know, where do you get those parts if that country is offline? So that's kind of what we're talking about. It's a very complex issue. It and is. it is <laughs> very unregulated. It is very... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so no, I'm sorry. This is the same thing I was actually talking about with my family. You know, because, the you know, the used cars and the chips. From yes. I want. No. And all the cars, I'm like, my goodness, does no one have a backup plan? Like, why don't can't we just make that same stuff right here? And, you know, like, I, you can, you don't have to totally stop in global trade, but why not have a plan B? I mean, you know, just, people just operate as something is and something not could happen, something couldn't happen. Like, hello, why not have a plan B where you say, okay, well, Taiwan's out of commission or any other country out in the world and having mm -hmm. a tough Okay, so let's just go to the factory in Utah and get in my chips. I, I, like, that I, makes no sense. And now I heard, I saw that, ooh, they're starting to make our own chips. I'm like, duh, like, hello, why don't right? you do that in the first place? Like, you not think? Like, it makes no, it's almost like with the Disney and universe, or universe. Mm -hmm. Yes, Universal, he's Hollywood hasn't done it, but Disney with the the Phase One and the Phase Two things, and those are great. But if you follow through with them, you never know what's going to happen between Phase One and Phase Two. You know, yeah. Vendor's campus is open, but boom, COVID happened, and guess what? Now Vendor's Phase Two, Phase Sixties could be eighty years down the line. No, this is why you, you should always build everything all at once, unless it's actively under construction, like Toontown or something, right? And something's yeah. just ready something's just ready then yeah go ahead and open it the rest is under construction it's not like you haven't started yet you know like mm -hmm. happening. it's just a part you haven't started i hate that it makes no sense and even if you want to spread out between the fiscal quarters they do something start something so you know i'm just kicking the can down the line and then the years go by and then oh all right well you know we'll leave it to the next ceo to, to do avengers because uh, you know even though it's a $14 billion franchise, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. kick it down the road because, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. Yeah. Even with Star Wars, Rise of Resistance was, it's, again, was actively under construction. It was just delayed. That's yeah. fine. It's just when they just don't start something and then 
then who knows? They're probably never going to start. Because <laughs> phase one, phase two, bullshit. <laughs> I, I mean, I know a lot of fans when it comes to these theme parks, especially Disney fans. Uh, they're really like gung ho for something new, right? They, oh, we, we want the new thing. We want the, you know, new uh, capital expenditures and all that. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I would love that. But right now, the Disney company is having problems maintaining their uh, rides they have right now. I mean, <laughs> yeah. have you seen the state of some of these things? They're running these things into the ground. And one of the reasons why are the supply chain issues that we talked about before, right? The A lot of these have kind of custom parts that they require fabrication out of some of these countries, and they're just not available right now. Right? I know the Radio Springs Racers crew, for example, um, they have to overhaul every single one of those cars after about 80,000 miles, and there are some cars that are coming up on that or have come up on that, and they simply they require parts that they cannot get a hold of. They have had work orders and, and parts uh, ordered for, gosh, six, eight months now, and they still haven't gotten them. Now, what happens when, you know, you have so many of these cars and you can't run them or you want to extend the life of these cars, uh, it, it, you know, for for a supply chain crisis that you really don't know when it's going to abate? Well, you have to reduce the amount of cars you run per day. And that's what we're mm -hmm. seeing with Radio Springs Racers right now. That's why it hasn't been operating at full capacity. Um, you, you look at Any Jones Adventure, from what I understand, the rolling ball effect hasn't worked for months, right? And everybody's kind of oh, been complaining. Really that hasn't. requires from what I understand, requires a specific part that you would be fabricating in one of these countries that they cannot get right now. And it's just all these things, you know, and, and you, ha you need maintenance technicians, which are in rare supply right now at any of these uh, parks that actually will do that work for you, right? You have mm -hmm. some labor shortages and so forth that prevent you from actually maintaining these attractions to the degree that you, that you can um, and that you'd want to. Plus, you have a reservation system that has this arbitrary cap on capacity where uh, you can't really uh, the, the only way you you can actually saturate a, 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 um, uh, guests and increase that cap is by having all these attractions open and operating so you, now you mm -hmm. have to operate these things into the ground essentially it's all these things that is really it's why we're seeing the maintenance problems that we're seeing today at the parks and people want new stuff? I mean, it's just like, it's just unrealistic. <laughs> right now, the company, with its liquidity issues, with its capital expenditure issues, they are focused on the studio. That's it. Bottom line, they're focused on the studio. That's not to say that they won't invest in the parks, but that's where their creative output, that's where their production, uh, that's where their, their revenue pipeline is most robust right now. And I think it's like, okay, that makes sense. The theme parks, they're going to have to take a back seat until some of those other issues are resolved in that marketplace. Robust, like Wastelands McCarthy would say, yeah? <laughs> oh, she would say it. Uh, Robust. That's how she would say it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, that's disappointing. Oh, you see, if you had a crack of plans, she both I know. Most place instead of one place you know. <sighs> wizard i'm telling you right now that's a very complex issue and i'm just telling you i'll, I'll say it like this okay <laughs> <laughs> there is a reason why a lot of things are built out of some of those countries that we can't <laughs> necessarily name that is by design and a lot of leaders for a lot of years they went along with it until it's now reached almost national security proportions. It's, it is ridiculous. There, 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 there were some uh, politicians who won't be named who uh, were trying to get ahead of that, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other, whole other can of worms there. In the theme park context, sorry, folks, until some of these issues regarding this, these industries are resolved, uh, uh, we're in this for the long haul I, and there's just no easy way to put it now I mean the state of Splash Mountain for example is just horrific now, see, and Splash Mountain, that one that was already a sad state before the supply chain yeah that was sad for years which is so yes. sad because it's such a good ooh you know I'm about to cry thinking about it I'm really sad the day it closes sorry for the people 
that may not be. Mm-hmm. But I will be. I might just be heartbroken. In fact, I had a dream the other day. Uh, the day. Splash on clothes and that was a very sad dream. In fact, I listened to the Splash Mountain Music Medley, which Disneyland Disney better not take off Apple Music. If they do, I'm gonna go over there <laughs> over and over again last night. Because so I was like, when when Mickey and Minnie's was announced, I was like, oh yay! So we said it's early, but I'm like, oh wait, oh no. Yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. <laughs> they weren't just announcing the opening date of a ride, Wizard. They were also announcing, between the lines, the closing timeline of Beloved Splash Mountain. And, and, and I look. Like, I was like, yeah. I got my uh, planning going because I, I, I really I want to be on the very, if I can, be the very last log to label the guests, but not just the last few in the last hour. Oh, I had a whole I have a whole plan going and I was very I was hoping I wouldn't be using it for a while. And I'm so sad. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad too. I, I I I gotta be honest, I was I was in a splash mountain log and I was going through uh, conceivably what's gonna be my last time going on an attraction. You I gotta come through. out before January. <sighs> I, special trip. Well, if like I can, TV. wizard. If I can. If I if I do, all, and you're there, okay. I will definitely make the we make the effort. Meet up, and we all got to ride it one uh, last time, one time together, and then of course I got to ride in January, <laughs> right? You so, I, I the 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 state of Splash Mountain right now is awful. It's it's very uh, dusty. It's very dirty. It's uh, a lot of I'm trying to start working, and if they are working, they're not lit. <laughs> You know, it's just it's in a it's in a bad state. Painting, paint, and all that. It's in a bad state. Okay, but I was I was going through there. I was seeing the finale scene with the, with the boat going, you know, back and forth, everything like that, which is just a, an incredible Bob Gurr help design thing there. And I'm just looking at these kind of Mark Davis uh, figures and some of these uh, you know other figures that were custom made for the attraction. And I'm just going through there, and I am the story of Michael Eisner and Frank Wells getting this attraction, you know, getting this attraction built. Tony Baxter pitching it, you know, Bruce Gordon working on it. Uh, one of his last things that he ever worked on. I, you know, you just you're going through it and it's like, I just all came. I don't know. It just emotionally hit me in just the perfect way where I kind of teared up, you know, as we were going across that bend there. Cause it's like, this is so great. This is so fantastic. And all it needs is just a little bit of TLC. And this thing is, you know, good for 30 years. And well, <laughs> now we're getting this. And, and it's like, how did we get here? How did we go from just a, such a great, beautiful attraction to salt mine? I, I mean, it's just, I got to be honest. It's like, wow, it's just, honestly, it's just the politics of today. That's how we got here. And it, and it just brought a tear to my eye. I, 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 I will fully admit because it's, it's, these things aren't supposed to happen this way. And yet here's what we're seeing. Crown. There's the crown again. <laughs> There's the crown. Yeah. Um. Look and listen, <laughs> folks. I know a lot of people are like, "Oh, they're gonna spend the money. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be fantastic." <laughs> Guys, they didn't even spend the money to build a new model. Okay, they used <laughs> the old Splash Mountain model or and big two, chunks of it. What does that two tell two you? Off of it. Yeah. Yeah. They they chopped off. Uh, uh, what is it? The uh, 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 not the prior patch, but the, but the just Chicken Pin Hill, right? They chopped that off and they did all this kind of stuff. Listen, folks, if they're not spending money on the model, <laughs> who do you think the chances are that they're going to spend a lot of money on the actual attraction itself? Okay, I mean it's laughable. This is a joke. And don't uh, forget about the uh, colored mist. <laughs> the Bayou Mist. I love that too. I love how. <laughs> <laughs> you have Trita Carter up there who has, uh, for my understand, has done great work on attractions like uh, I, I know she did um, work on the uh, Mickey Minis Wonder Why Railway, but even before then, she worked on uh, the projections for Indiana Jones Adventure and stuff like that. Like, she's done great work. She's done great work, no question. And at this D23 Expo event where we're expecting that they're going to finally show us what this attraction is going to be, and one of the last times they can even show this thing. 
We don't get they much come- more than this. That's what we get. We get by you mist, which is basically lights through fog, <laughs> fog machine. That's 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 what we've been working on for the last three plus years or whatever. And we get a, a, a piece of concept artwork that we've seen millions of times before, and a model that looks like crap. Honestly, I mean, it's just like, come on, like what? I, uh, it's it's so frustrating. This is a beloved attraction. This is an attraction that people. Love to be on, and uh, oh, the Mama Odie's thing. I, I guess looks cool, but then you think, oh well, we can't have Doctor Facilier because they're going to do a sequel attraction. And it's going to be some food co-op thing where we're looking for a special ingredient, and we're not getting Ray the Firefly because of it. It's it's. Uh, um, there's a there's a piece of audio that I played on a previous show. I, I play it here, but I, I I'd have to find it. Um, piece of audio from uh. The, like I, I mentioned before, the Jim Hill Lentesta Disney Dish podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like, this has now gone from a very fun attraction, something that was really looked forward to by large swaths of the population, to a kind of well meaning attraction, right? A very kind of socially charged attraction, right? Let's just say, okay. And it's like, who wants to ride that? Who wants to ride through Tiana's business empire in the form of a co-op? I I mean, who wants to ride through a salt mine? Nobody wants to do this. People, I think, when they heard Tiana, and look, uh, on OG55, we had a a, a gal named uh, Ashton the Slytherin, uh, who, uh, great YouTube channel, definitely check it out, but uh, she came on the show, and she described that she was very, very excited for this attraction. And I told her, I said, well, you're not going to get Dr. Facilia. You're not going to get Ray the Firefly. You're not going to get the story of the attraction played out um, in kind of a book report form, as Tony Baxter puts it. You're going to get a sequel attraction that's not going to feature any of those characters, Going not going to feature a large part of the, the songs that are that are featured in that ride and so uh, and that uh, movie and so forth. And sh- you could see the life <laughs> um, you know the the excitement just kind of uh, fade from her face, <laughs> and as it turns to from excitement to despair in a matter of twenty seconds, as I was describing this whole thing, because she recognized right there in that moment that her expectations were not going to be fulfilled. What is going to happen to the large swath of guests who actually ride this thing? Um. With a similar notion in mind. Yeah, that would be um, pretty disappointing. I would think so. Yeah. Also, too, this is going to have this elaborate storyline, which I don't know if I don't even know if five percent of guests will actually get it <laughs> uh, if it's not you know described to them, right? Uh, and then to make matters worse, this has their height requirements. I believe is it is it forty inches? Yeah, we get forty inches still. So, for the large swath of little girls um, who want to see their favorite princess represented, they won't be able to. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's nonsense. It, it is. I, I think it, 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 it started out as something very. Um, you know, people might have reservations about this, but I, I believed in their minds it was very well intentioned. You know, mm-hmm. replacing a beloved attraction with a a modern beloved story, right? For and we can go into why that was done or whatever. Okay, but you go from Prince and the Frog, which should be very straightforward, to co op salt mine new songs. Which, by the way, Wizard, you bring up a good point. I'll give you credit for this one. They did not premiere those new songs at D23 Expo in the venue that they should have. They just showed the old ones. Right, right, right. That was your chance, and they didn't. What does that tell you, folks? Yet they premiered the new song of Disney's Wondrous Journeys. Yes. So they can write new songs in two years. It's possible. (laughs) They can, and still, (laughs) we haven't seen the fruits of that three-plus-year uh, creative development process for this attraction. And that's Besides got a lot of people trip. nervous. <laughs> Go ahead. Besides the research trip to New Orleans. Which <laughs> yeah. Is cool. Oh, uh, you know, I, I love that, that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and, and the research trip was one of the reasons why we got the salt mine because the salt mines as this, um, 
as some of their uh what is it um um uh, consultants from the new orleans area told them there is no higher <laughs> elevation in uh, uh new orleans right the only thing that we have is really avery island that's the highest elevation that we have there and that's kind of the uh that goes along with the tabasco storyline which they've kind of implemented in kind of a cool way in this uh this uh to be honest my adventure attraction right but it's like you know, and, and then I, I love this too. I think it was Carbon Smith who was up there saying uh, on the D23 Expo panel, she was saying that, uh, oh, we're going to give you, we're, you know, we're going to make you want to visit New Orleans. I'm sorry, but New Orleans Square right next to this thing has been doing that since 1965, I think. Yeah. Come on. I mean, Walt did that. Let's let's be honest, guys. I, I don't think this is going to be make or break New Orleans visit off this thing. <laughs> New Orleans it's Square does that perfectly be, fine. It's not even be in the town. It's in the it's in the swamp. New, yeah, so I don't know. You would want to go to visit a swamp. <laughs> Not <twist> words over there. <laughs> I don't know what they're thinking. I mean, they're 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 they're, as we say, uh, what is it? Uh, high in their own supply. You know, it's it's it, they're they're. I think they're out of touch. Yeah. To, to put it, be, uh, for Imagineer mm -hmm. who retires or or something when this mm -hmm. is, and they should make a whole documentary on the whole process. I'd be so interested to see what. Went off. <laughs> what? No. I, 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 well, I can break deep down the story beats right now. Apparently, yeah. from what I have heard, it started out as it was going to be because the problem is with with the Prince and the Frog movie is that it, even back when that movie came out in two thousand nine, mm -hmm. there were issues plaguing that movie surrounding how Tiana was represented in that movie. Frankly, she was represented in frog form for most of that movie. And they didn't want to repeat those mistakes when it came to the attraction itself, which I can kind of understand, but eh, you lose a lot when you do that. Okay, so they started out with the thesis that this was going to be a sequel attraction, right? And it was going to take place right after Prince Naveen and Tiana actually do the kiss, right? And transform, and there you go. There's your there's your jumping off point for your new story. And, and see, the new story... The only thing with that is, where did it go? Uh, mm -hmm. It, it, it uh, just had the picture up in this model here. Here you go. Yeah, there. So um, there's still frogs, and for a portion of it. Yeah, there. There. Well, there. There are frogs are present. Frogs present. Maybe that's not them. But All right. Okay. <laughs> like, come but on. If, do you have the original concept artwork that was released back uh, in? Um, yes, uh, just before the summer of 2020. The Mama Odie's thing? Mama Odie's thing, yeah. Okay, and the reason why... I mean, they were literally going in that direction. I mean, that you know that was <laughs> drawn up very quickly, right? <laughs> For the <laughs> uh, certain events that played out during that time. However, that's where they were going, right? It's like, okay. Uh, the problem was when they focus grouped the storyline that they were going with, which is basically trying to find uh, Louis the Alligator's trumpet. The, the what they realized was Tiana wasn't in a majority of it, and people really wanted to see Tiana represented. So mm -hmm. the storyline, the, 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 the trumpet finding thing was dropped, and it became a storyline featuring Tiana very, very heavily and and represented uh, 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 multiple times during that attraction. So now you take the storyline from just out following the kiss in her dress as she's depicted right there. And now you, you stretch it out. Uh, um, I think like two years, I think is when the events of this attraction actually come to fruition. Tiana has been, uh, successful in her food empire. Uh, after, after her first Tiana's palace became a runaway success. She's now expanded out. She's franchised. Now, see, this is where the complicated story comes from. <laughs> and now she has this kind of co-op in the bayou. And it's like, okay, that's great. You know, but as I just, uh, mentioned when they went on this research trip and, and spoke to some of their consultants that were, you know, from new Orleans itself, they were like, well, wait a minute, hang on here. Um, you, you know, you can't have this kind of elevation thing that we have, uh, in the attraction that you depict here, you know, it, it, you have to make it uh, far more authentic. And from what I understand, Sherita Carter has been very much on this authentic kit, 
uh, kick. It has to be authentic, whatever they do. And in pursuing that, that's where the salt mine thing comes in. That's where, you know, um, some other elements of this, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, implementation of, what is it, uh, New Orleans art and so forth, that's where that comes from, right? That's where that mentality comes from. Well, okay, so maybe it's time to make the Splash Mountain facade look smaller, and that's where Mama Odie's boat finally gets the gets the axe. Now, there were other problems associated with that. Weight was an issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, remember, this was going to take place in Orlando as well. Orlando, hurricane area, that yeah. might have caused some issues as well, right? So they lopped that off, and in their uh, charge towards authenticity... It's now time to make this make the uh, uh, um, Splash Mountain facade look smaller than it is. So that's where you get the big um, uh, uh, what is it uh, uh, trees and so forth, those Louisiana trees, right? Um, that are kind of oversized that make the mountain look smaller. And that's where you get the water tower. The water tower is to make the mountain look smaller than it is because the water tower is it, it, its proportion is a little bit larger than it should be, right? And it's like, that's how that happens. <laughs> that's why we get what we got. And people aren't going to know that story and aren't going to care. Very it's all going to be the quality of the attraction itself. And to, <laughs> to be honest, it's just not there. Not that yeah, I've seen know, it. And for speaking of Orlando's version, their mountain is similar, but it looks different. But well, we haven't seen any models or anything of it. A concept yeah. art. Is it going to look so similar to what's happened? And then they have a whole frontier land thing. What's, what's that? Is, is that why it's closing later, maybe? Because yeah, yeah. Like so this, this is a complicated thing, too. There are two distinct teams doing <laughs> each version of the attraction. Now, obviously, their head... They're headed by uh, 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 the, the 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 team doing development uh, for for mm -hmm. both, obviously. But but the the people who are actually implementing these changes and so forth, and actually um, the the team on the ground doing all this, it's two distinct teams. Mm -hmm. And again, Walt Disney World is a little bit different than Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland, you can have attraction go down for two years, ain't no problem. Walt Disney World, that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. And the timelines are very different. Um, Splash Mountain, comparative to Disneyland's, is in great shape. That tells you that they haven't necessarily given up on that attraction. <laughs> and so that will be going down at a later date. People think Tron, I'm not so sure, but when Tron comes up in the spring of uh, 2023, a lot of people mm -hmm. are thinking that's when it's going to go down. We'll see on that. But again, you probably have to work on a, probably a more accelerated timetable than you do for Disneyland's version. Maybe they do like a Jungle Cruise thing <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, it's partially open, right? I, I don't know. Yeah. That's going to be an interesting yeah. thing. Uh, but there is a reason, Wizard, that you haven't seen anything from Walt Disney World's because yeah. they're still working it out. Additionally, like you said, the Frontierland problem, right? You're mm. smack down in the middle of Frontierland that's supposed to take place at the latest 1890s, right? Mm. 1850s, 1890s, somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, this Tiana's story takes place in the 1920s, 1930s or something like that. I think it's uh, that the, wasn't it 1927 uh, on the oh, yeah. uh, water tower? Okay. Yeah. So what do you do here? From what I can gather... The plan might be, it might be long term. This might not happen out mm -hmm. at jump, but long term, I think the plan is to turn the south part, south of Splash Mountain at Walt Disney World and Magic Kingdom, mm -hmm. the south end of that into a New Orleans type setting mm -hmm. and shift Frontierland from where that was to the north so that Big Thunder is your. Frontierland representation and beyond it, this is where the what if segment comes into yeah. play. Beyond it, you have Coco um, and Encanto and those stories that represents Frontierland. I think that's the idea there. Wow, that would have been great to mention at D23. <laughs> Since here, yeah, there was all what if anyway. Yeah, what, what if? if. 
New Orleans when his new uh, came to the Magic Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Well, that means we have approximately, let's see. Uh, let's see. How many days? Well, assuming we have until January 10th. 10th. Uh, 10th, 2023. Yeah. We have 94 days until January 10th, 2023. Oh, boy. That's you less, have less than 100 days, folks, to see Splash Mountain as it currently exists in Disneyland because, from what we understand, this is coming. Oh, boy. Wow. Scary. Um, no. mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Rash Guy, for joining me on this two hour and 15 minute nap story time with Dre. Story time with the doctor. That's what I'm call these story time with the doctor. Yeah. And where can everyone find you? Hey, the best place to uh, follow me is going to be at Vash Guy on Twitter. It's right down there. Just go ahead and type it in the Twitters, and it should pop up for all the, uh, as Wayside McCarthy would say, for all the robust discussion. You can go ahead and do that right down there. And if you want to see me, well, it's going to be on Orange Go 55 at Freshly Squeezed, your source for juicy news and info squeezed fresh right from the Grove. Now... Wizard, I do apologize. Every single time we have a we have a meeting, I always play this drop, but I forgot to play oh, yeah. it. So let's go ahead for good time, good old time's sake. Let's go ahead and play the drop right now. There you go. Whoa. That's right. If you don't know what that is, then that sucks. But, <laughs> yeah, what do you do? <laughs> subscribe for more theme park updates. Follow the OG55 crew for some Disney discussion. Some internal Disney discussion you won't find anywhere else. With some special guests that you also won't find anywhere else. And let me know what you guys think of the Splash Mountain, Fast and Furious, Grinchmas, Epcot, Drones, and all the other great stuff that I mentioned in this conversation down below. And have a fantastic day.